Hey, everybody. We are here. The Generic Ride News Talk live stream, pre-stream. Good job being here a little bit early, everybody. Sorry, we're getting started a little bit late, but it must be done when the, the monkey apocalypse is upon us. I am, as we speak, sending out the text message. So if anybody out there is not tuning in, they will now know it is time. Well, the show is uh, its going to be good. We got a great show for you. Hope everybody's weekend was wonderful. As usual, remember, head on over to canarycry.party. That's H-T-T-P colon forward slash forward slash canarycry.party. That'll get you to all of our links, including uh, it'll give you an opportunity to produce the show. Uh, remember, producing before the show is the best, but producing during the show is still good much better than not producing the show at all so uh thank you to the producer coming in and uh today was a great opportunity for somebody to show up and get demooched baby it's about time come on uh completely i do we quite possibly could be one of the most independent news commentary media properties on the planet we can only stay that way because of you, dear listener, becoming a producer of the show, head on over to canarycry.party or even better, canarycry.support to keep this show completely independent and running. All right, folks, stay hydrated. Buckle your seatbelts. We got a good show for you. Let's go. The world is getting crazier. People are acting more and more insane. The end of the world is tomorrow. 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 See, there's only one thing to do when the world is falling apart. Listen to Basil and Gons as they discuss this week's news and events through the lens of Bible prophecy. You are listening to Canary Cry News Talk. You're listening to Canary Cry News Talk. Today is May 23rd, 2022, and we are live to tape this episode 488. And today, Monkey Poxalypse. And signing on from off the grid, Razzle Dazzle, I'm your best buddy, Basil. And my name is Gons, your favorite Asian provocateur for Christ, a.k.a. the Cabana Boy, here to serve you a podcast that brings you the best news, which is the gospel message of Jesus Christ, while reporting the egregious with a well-rounded, biblically grounded take on world events. That's and we're right. Back. We're back. I'm feeling a different energy today. I'm feeling very, I don't know, I'm feeling very officially a newsy today, folks. Mm. So no jokes, no jokes today. All hard hitting news. Uh, but while we're at it, remember, dear Canarian, that if you listen to the show on Friday, once again, you are ahead of the news. You are ahead of reality things that were predicted on Friday are coming true today. Just to give you a little rundown, Monkeypox, the Monkeypox ellipse has begun, and we will recap uh, some of our ideas uh, from last week and explain how they are coming true just three days later. Of course, Biden and China, y'all Canarians saw this one coming too. He said it. He said the thing we said he would say. Uh, Flippy will be popping in. We got a breakdown of the Great Reset as uh, uh, Davos kicks off this week. And then one Mo Gan, we're going to be talking about how Time Magazine thinks that Christianity needs to be held accountable for white supremacy. And then we'll take a little break and you YouTubers, you'll have to find another place to watch the show because we do have some COVID news today. So that's right. After the first break, YouTubers hop on over to Twitch or some other location. UFO news, Antarctica, it's going to be a wonderful show. But first, let us start with our lead stories. Yeah, our lead story again. We don't have an official jingle yet. But oh, still still waiting for a monkey pox jingle. And we got monkeys and canaries. Monkeys and canaries, Basil. It's, it's all coming together. That's now, right. At the end of the last episode, we were pointing out the, the, the CDC and other organizations highlighting the male-on-male -male or those who identify as male-on-male -male, uh, transmission. Of mon monkey yes, pox. the beginning of last episode. Yes, and part end. of, yeah. well, I guess, well, the end of the segment, I guess. You uh, mm -hmm. had asked the question, I wonder how they're going to use the LGBTQ 
group crowd whatever you want to call it um immunity yeah uh as part of this monkey pox endeavor and yep they answered Basil. And the elites had the lizard people have responded they in grand always fashion. listen man they <laughs> listen to the show and when we ask a question they answer it quickly because over here at dailymail.com.uk we've got a long headline here pride festival in Gran Canaria, which was attended by 80,000 people, is linked to Spanish monkeypox outbreak, as well as two cases in Italy, while European total reaches 100. Whoa! Dun, dun, dun. Look at that. All you got to do is read the CDC website to predict how they will start unfolding the uh, the the drama as far as the monkeypox outbreak is going. And there it is, right know, there, I folks. Know, you, I know the angle. You know it. I know the angle now, and this is... Uh, you do. Yeah, yeah. And and it, it's no surprise to anyone, you know, looking at this, but uh, all the quarantining, I know it's not happening yet in the United States or in the West at large, but it can get to a point where if you're not taking a vaccine or if you're not locking down, then you are against the gay community. I think mm-hmm. that's, that's yeah, you're where putting, this is headed. You're putting... You are... It, it is a social... Ju- it is an attack... On the social justice, uh, you know, com- community or right. movement just by uh, not wearing your mask, which, yeah. you know, they've been building that for a while. So here we go. Pride Festival in Gran Canaria, which was attended by 80,000 people, is linked to Spanish monkeypox outbreak, as well as two cases in Italy. Well, European total reaches 100. The Gran Canarian Pride Festival, attended by 80,000 from Britain and across Europe, is being investigated after being linked to numerous monkeypox cases in Madrid, Italy, and Tenerife. Held between May 5th and May 15th, Mas Palomas Pride attracts visitors from across the continent. It was attended by people who have tested positive for the monkeypox virus afterwards, with public health services from the Canary Islands now investigating the any links. <laughs> nice. Between the cases and the LGBT plus celebrations. Wow. Among the 30 or so diagnosed in Madrid, there are several who attended the event, although it is not yet possible. It's not yet possible to know if one of them is patient zero of this outbreak or if they got infected there, a health source told El Pais. There are two suspected cases in men in the Canary Islands, one with links to the LGBT LGBT. Plus, they they dropped the cue. I must have missed the memo on that uh, <laughs> festival. There's no conclusive evidence that the latest outbreak is being sexually transmitted, rather than simply being passed between people who were in close proximity to each other. Experts said. As such, gay men are not believed to be more likely to contract the disease. However, are potentially more likely to have been exposed to it <laughs> due to the known incidences being at events and locations that attract large numbers of people from across the LGBT plus community. Now, this is a little strange to me, Gans, because again, the CDC website mentioned specifically gay men uh, having well, they, more... Yes, yeah. I know. The, those self-identifying as men, <laughs> yeah, having contact with men. <laughs> but that's besides the point. Uh-huh. Why? Why not... The lesbian community. Why not the queer community? Why not oh, yeah. trans Q is completely people? dropped. Uh, they, uh, the B, maybe, the, the buys maybe. are still in there, and the Qs are dropped. Well, maybe but the, the Q, point is, the Q anon crowd killed Q for the LGBTQ community. That's quite possible. Yeah. But they are specifically have a paragraph here. As such, gay men are not believed to be more likely to contract the disease, leaving out, uh, you know, at least f- f- four. F- Three fourths of the LGBT plus community. Anywho, the development came after it emerged. Spanish authorities are also investigating confirmed cases of monkeypox that have been linked to a sauna mm. in which Spain uh, is used to describe establishments popular with gay men looking for sex rather than just a bathhouse. There's a lot of information, a lot of uh, <laughs> twists and turns and info about the gay official, community. Nothing is official, but. It's connected to all these things that yeah, lots of talk about specifically gay men and and monkeypox. Even though they go they over and over tell us that they're not connected. However, 
they're a little bit connected. <laughs> a spokesperson for the department confirmed that one of the Italian men who has the virus was in the Canary Islands, but denied knowing if the man from Tenerife had traveled there. According to a report from the Spanish news website, a second Italian man who was also in the Canary Islands contracted the virus. We get the point here. So there you go. We asked the question and uh, they answered We still don't know exactly why so much attention is being paid to the LGBT plus community in connection with the monkeypox. However, I think in the context of narrative building guns, we know exactly what's going on here. It's the midterms. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure to connect this to some sort of uh, important culture war topic. Oh, yeah. Uh, Along those lines... Talking about the culture war topic here, Politico.eu, headline, Belgium introduces quarantine for monkeypox cases. It's happening. Uh It's happening. Ah! This is exactly what we're talking about. Belgium has become the first country to introduce a compulsory 21-day quarantine for monkeypox patients after reporting Four cases of the disease in the compulsory. past Compulsory. I like that. I like compulsory. that they're being compulsive. <laughs> not mandatory, not uh, <laughs> compulsory. Belgian health Oops. authorities took the decision on Friday, according to Belgian media. Monkeypox contact cases are not required to self-isolate, but should remain vigilant, particularly if they are in contact with vulnerable people. Oh, that's just the contact. So if you come in contact with someone... You don't have to quarantine, but just keep in mind that the monkey, the monkeys are crawling all over you. <laughs> monkey pox is a disease in the same family of smallpox. We know this. La, la, la. Yeah. So uh, there you go. The quarantines have begun. The connection to the gay community has been solidified and denied at the same time. Um, and, you know, I, I fear perhaps if you mix these two things together... Um, much like, it, it, you know, as much as they like to say we're not connecting it, but, you know, it is gay men who are getting monkeypox, but it's not it's not their fault. It's not because they're gay. It's mm-hmm. just they happen to be, whatever, in a sauna with, <laughs> with monkeypox. Yeah. Um, what's being kind of set up is an in- interesting detail. I don't know. This might be, this is certainly just conjecture, but uh, you, we are building a situation where, uh, it will be sort of exclusive, or there is there is a possibility where this will create a sort of compulsory quarantine for gay people. They're locking up the gays, is what I'm saying. Mm. This is you know, and that that makes gives it an interesting spin because of course it was only you know Christian white supremacist domestic terrorists who didn't like quarantine during COVID. But now, if it's, you know, primarily LGBT plus people who are getting quarantined, it's going to kind of do a little flip-flop, man. Yeah, we're going to see Republicans. The other way. We're going to see Republicans say, release the gays! Let <laughs> yeah. the gays go! Well, exactly. This does kind of, yeah, <laughs> set up an interesting situation where the anti-lockdown people who are traditionally, you know, the narrative puts them in a box, meaning that, you know, that they don't like gay people or whatever. Right. Um, but this gives an opportunity for Republicans to fight for the rights, fight for gay rights, stop lock, locking up our LGBTQ plus people. Oh, and they got uh, Trump to lean on, too, because Trump was pro LGBTQ, despite his uh, Republican you know, yeah. rise, no, to he power, was always, rise to power. He was always pro pro whatever yeah. LG community. So there you go. Uh, Monkeypox continues. The, the situation is building and building and building. We've got uh, something like is somewhere between 80 and 92. I've seen a couple different numbers over here in the U.S., uh, which, of course, that's how it starts, man. That's mm-hmm. just how it starts. It starts with one, and then mm-hmm. it hits 100. I will and mention. Then it hits 1,000. And then it's, um, yeah, then we're locking everything down. Yeah. I will mention um, from another article that the quote here Biden himself 
Yes. Well, I'll take this. This is coming from CBS. On another matter, uh, he, Biden, sought to con concerns about recent cases of monkeypox that have been identified in Europe and the United States, saying he didn't see the need to institute strict quarantine measures. Speaking in Tokyo a day after he said the virus was something, quote, to be concerned about, the president said, quote, I just don't think it rises to the level of any kind of concern that existed with COVID-19. So he's sort of downplaying the threat that monkeypox could pose, um, which I think puts him again in a very interesting flip-flop position. Because if you remember, a couple weeks into the COVID outbreak here in the U.S., Trump was sort of downplaying the threat that COVID could play, and he was lambasted forever for it. You know, just mm -hmm. it was on the list of things that Trump got wrong. Oh, Trump didn't think COVID would be a big deal. He said it would only be two weeks, or he said it would end in April. And now look how wrong he is. Well, Biden coming out, doing the basically the exact same thing. So either this monkeypox thing is mainly a narrative being built by the uh, news, the corporate news establishment for whatever purpose. Of course, the midterms are coming up, so that's helpful. Or Biden is going to, you know, have to eat his hat later on down the road. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I mean, even if he does, is it going to matter? He's like, Teflon, man. He doesn't get uh, something. Something. <laughs> However, the, you know, CNN, I, actually, I didn't bring the story, but, um, you know, Chris Shilzilla has been kind of gone for a while. Yeah, what happened? Uh, yeah, well, let me tell you. Okay. He hasn't been doing much. He hasn't been getting featured. He hasn't been getting push notified to people's iPhones as much. He's sort of been laying low. Of course, we got the CNN uh, change of hands. The the leadership has been changing hands here, and uh, you know, turning into a real news outlet allegedly. Um, so you know, we're always worried about Chris because inflammatory conspiracy mongering about Trump is sort of his bread and butter. And I think they kind of toned him down. He kind of disappeared for a while. And today, actually, he came out with one of his analyses, analysis from Chris Shilzilla. And it is just uh, point after point after point lambasting Biden for getting things wrong over and over and over. So it's the same Chris Shilzilla playbook but they put him on the Biden beat instead of the Trump beat. Mm. Uh, so we'll see if he comes back. And uh, that that also, you know, was sort of a hint to me that they will be ready to absolutely pounce on Biden when he is, you know, wrong about monkeypox. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the narrative construction and the straw man being built up to be torn down later, it's all part of the, the staging here. Uh, but... Not surprisingly, Forbes.com had something to say, but not strictly about monkeypox, but conspiracy theorists. The oh. headline, monkeypox outbreak triggers new conspiracy theories about Bill Gates as uh. hashtag Bill Gates bioterrorist trends. <laughs> They're already on the Bill Gates train, huh? What does he have to do with this? Yeah, Bruce, <laughs> written by Bruce Y. Lee, written by Bruce Lee. Thanks, oh, cool. Bruce Lee. Yeah. Appreciate the, the info here. Well, that certainly didn't take long. Once the current monkeypox outbreak spread to the U.S., it was only a matter of time before conspiracy theories about this outbreak began spreading as well. Well, oh. like facts about how the Nuclear Threat Initiative did a whole mm -hmm. drill on monkeypox outbreak yeah. in November of 2021. That kind yeah. of conspiracy theory? What are you talking about, Perhaps. Bruce Lee? How somehow it's uh, connected or targeted at the LGBTQ plus community. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. That was straight from the CDC website. Free My the bad. Gays. <laughs> and it was only a matter of time before such conspiracy theories began mentioning Bill Gates, the Microsoft co-founder and billionaire philanthropist. All of this should be about as surprising as a cat fight or a here's why you stink speech on a reality TV show. Well, great. Mm. The... the Lovely references. After all, consider how many different Bill Gates-related conspiracy theories have emerged ever since the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic began in early 2020. What is this outlet? What outlet is this? Uh, Forbes. Oh, mm, weird. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yes, uh, I will just point out that Bill Gates' conspiracy theories existed well before COVID. So uh -huh. this guy has no yeah. 
context. They're late to the game. Yeah, you're very late to the game. So, uh, some of which I covered on Forbes back in April 2020. Oh, good job, buddy. Mm-hmm. For example, there was that Gates placing microchips and COVID-19 vaccines to track everyone uh, for who bah, knows bah. why conspiracy theory that people uh-huh. shared on Facebook and smartphones. Two things that ironically... Facebook and smartphones, he says? Two things that ironically do actually track people. Uh Some politicians have further fueled such theories by either not denouncing them or even propagating them. Speaking of politicians, take a wild guess as to which congressperson has been among those pushing some of the latest monkeypox and Gates conspiracy theories in a space laser-like manner. Here's a hint. Her name rhymes with... Our jury mailer bean. That's pretty funny. Wow. Yes. Take this a look. article is this article is pretty laborious, but <laughs> yes, <is>. as sort <laughs> of <laughs> an ironic Bruce touch, Lee. that was kind of a fun one. Okay. Yeah, yes. Take a look at what Rep. Uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene said on Thursday's edition of her Facebook Live show. I guess she said that uh, Bill Gates is going to use monkey pox, pox as another scam to make money and control the world. And he also wants everyone to eat fake, fake meat created in a lab and drink poop water. <laughs> Why is Bill Gates running everything? Well, you know, well, he all does those want things, us to drink poop water. I was going to say, yes, all, those, all things, those things are true. It's true. I mean, she summarizes them. It sounds absurd, but I mean, these are backed up by facts, probably yeah. articles that Forbes themselves have published on behalf of Bill Gates. But I digress. Yeah. It's so weird that that's what they pulled out. Back to the article. Whoa, that's certainly a live one. Throughout the video, Taylor Greene made a number of claims about an outbreak without providing that little thing called evidence. (laughs) I want to know what she said. What did she say? For example, she claimed that, quote, Bill Gates is very concerned about monkeypox because this is something apparently he could make a lot of money off of him and his other buddies, end quote. Yeah. Is, he, yeah, he that's... admits he he brags about the return he gets on yeah. what he invests in in uh, vaccination. It's like a whole in talking vaccines. point in his lecture. That is not a stuff. conspiracy theory. <laughs> he said he makes twenty two x on vaccine investments. And she, I'm not even putting him down for that. That sounds like a great investment opportunity. <laughs> she then talked about, quote unquote, disgusting pictures of monkeypox lesions, saying that, quote, they're going to have pictures of all of these kinds of terrifying images. They're going to show children with this all over their faces. And of course, they're going to be from I don't know where they're going to be from. End quote. Yeah. Again, okay. why? Why is that <laughs> right. conspiracy theory? That's called the news. Taylor the, Green the, didn't specify <laughs> who they might be. Could they be the Gestapo police or may- maybe the medical brown? Sh- and it goes on and on like this. I mean, just, the, the what? <laughs> I mean, the, the they is the news. The news is going to show the boils on children and people. Probably mostly most of the pictures so far have been on uh, black people in Africa who, who this disease is endemic that's just a, a more of a common disease there people only care about it now because suddenly white people are getting it because the news is racist there i said it can you believe it can you believe i said such a thing sorry susan all right keep yeah, going they just they, you know i don't want to read because there's it's nothing else like there it's it's ridiculous it's, he, this is a social engineering uh, uh, exercise yes. that bruce lee is and pulling bruce here Bruce lee just keeps bringing up where's the evidence there's not much evidence where's the evidence and it's like hey bruce lee have you evidence actually for what? The, the claims that are being made about it you know, blah, the blah, claims blah. are all true i know Bruce it's Lee, crazy. You, there's a thing called the internet. You can uh, type in to the Googlers there. I don't know. Maybe you don't want them to, to know that you looked up some search terms like the truth about monkeypox or something. Who knows? But um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's you got to be really compartmentalized to think like this. It's just, yeah. you know, and, and that's that's part of the breakdown here is that you know, the, the sort of delusion continues about this stuff for the general public people that mm-hmm. would read forbes and you know buy a hook line and sinker i mean maybe they deserve to believe the lies if they can't critically think or at least investigate for themselves you know and we're not saying that we're so right and they're so wrong it's more like look just do your own investigation and it doesn't take long spend 10 minutes and uh, find out if the claims have any basis and 
I don't know. I don't think Bruce Lee did that senior contributor. Right. And one exam, one great way to do that research is simply to sign up for our newsletter where we send out all the sources for yeah. the show that we use or f- sources that we use for the show. And, you know, pretty much every claim that Marjorie Taylor Greene made here is backed up by mainstream corporate news. That's not even conspiracy theory. Bill Gates makes a lot of money on vaccines. He admits it. 22x on each investment. Uh, Yes, the news is going to show pictures of people with monkeypox. Yeah, they're going to tell you to wear a mask because if you get too close to anybody's face and they spit on you, you're going to contract this horrible, terrifying disease, monkeypox. That's another quote from her. Yeah, they're going to tell us to wear a mask. Like, Why is that a conspiracy theory? (laughs) It's crazy. It's complete crazy talk what this fella is writing in Forbes. Now, in Here's contrast. one. There is uh, there there is one conspiracy theory that is floating around, uh-huh. and just for the YouTube uh, employee who is keeping an eye on us here today, we're just letting we are bringing this up to make aware our listeners the types of conspiracy theories that they might see, and uh, well, what this is, what it, what follows is a lesson in uh you know news literacy we are going to do an exercise in uh, <laughs> news literacy here and this comes from an article written on the nationalpulse.com the nationalpulse.com we've uh we've actually criticized before <laughs> doing this exact thing they uh have had dubious reports in the past um, mysterious funding structures, uh, not very good at linking sources, things like that. So they're a great opportunity to practice our news literacy. Uh, Gans, do you want to read through this a little sure, bit? And sure. We can, so the, we can do the exercise together here. Yeah. So the National Pulse, uh, is it EXC? Is that exclusive? The yeah, yes. The infamous Wuhan lab recently assembled monkeypox strains using methods flagged for creating contagious pathogens. Okay. Pretty pretty provocative headline. Provocative headline, but also not actually that weird. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, we know that that's what they did. They they experimented, and uh, we, I mean, of course, we know all sorts of other experiments they did, um, but that's their job. Their job is to experiment with zoonotic diseases and see, you know, what they can do to make them more exciting. Yeah. The Wuhan Institute of Virology assembled the monkeypox virus genome, allowing the virus to be identified through PCR tests using a method researchers flagged for potentially creating a, quote, contagious pathogen the National Pulse can reveal. Can reveal. Okay. The study was first published. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. As far as a decent analysis of uh, a sure. news story, National Pulse can reveal is a weird way to put that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have been allowed to reveal. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, there's different ways to interpret that, I suppose. Uh, yeah. The study was first published, and that word published is hyperlinked to a Science Direct article in February 2022, just months before the latest international outbreak, which is linked to a CNBC article of monkeypox cases, which appear to have now reached the U.S. The paper, which was authored by nine Wuhan Institute of Virology researchers and published in the lab's quarterly scientific journal, Virologica Sinica, also follows the wide-scale use of polymerase chain reaction, that's the PCR test, to identify COVID-19 positive individuals. Researchers mm-hmm. appear... Now, real quick, mm. real quick, because this is, this is an interesting detail, because, you know, sources and things like that, extremely important when it yeah, comes yeah, to yeah, yeah. news literacy and figuring out what's going on here. So, uh, the claim here, or what's being reported by the National Pulse, is that the Wuhan Institute of Virology has their own quarterly scientific journal mm-hmm. called Virologica Sinica, which is interesting that a single lab would have their own journal that they post in. Now, I am not a science industry professional, um, but I am unaware of many other labs who really just have their own journal that they publish in. Uh, that seems like an, seems like it would present 
strange opportunities for conflicts of interest, considering that the idea behind a scientific journal is that, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the peer review process. You know, you get your peers, they review it, it's uh, available in the journal, and, you know, once it's all peer reviewed and, and um, you know, people have had time to check your science and perhaps even try to repeat it or whatever, uh, then it gets put into a scientific journal. The fact that this scientific journal is, like, published by the lab itself, I find a little strange, mainly because I just have not heard of that before. But you know, continue. Yeah, I was going into that rabbit trail there, looking at the journal Virology. Lots, lots of things. Sinica. Yeah, uh, and the fact that the journal is, the link at least to the journal, it does not have its own sort of publishing site. It's, it doesn't link to virologicasyndica.com or something. It, it links to sciencedirect.com, which is sort of an open source publishing right. uh, platform. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The paper, which uh, da, 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 we already did that. Researchers appeared to identify a portion of the monkeypox virus genome, enabling PCR tests to identify the virus in the paper. Uh, quote, efficient assembly of a large fragment of monkeypox virus genome as a qPCR template using dual selection-based transformation associated recombination. And there's a screenshot of the Woo! article there. Uh, monkeypox virus, referred to as MPXVs in the paper, have strains that are, quote, more pathogenic and have been reported to infect humans in various parts of the world. Quote, quantitative P qPCR is the gold standard for the detection of orthopox virus, including MX or MPXV for pan orthopox virus detection. The E9L DNA polymerase gene has been shown to be an excellent target for qPCR assays or assays for MPXV detection. Uh, okay, okay. It's a little complicated. I'm just going to skip yeah, It's very technical right <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is another, th which is kind of a, a little bit of a red flag for me. Right. Um, if, you just, if you're just quoting technical just, terminology without yeah, explaining it, it's a little bit suspicious as to how copying, the National Pulse might be interpreting that information. Exactly. Copying and pasting extremely technical like pieces of the scientific article, the scientific journal, rather. Like, it sounds super fancy, and it's sort of used to give credibility to the article. However, 0.1% of people who read this article might actually understand it. And the rest of us, we read the big words, and we say, oh, wow, yes, that sounds very official and serious. Um, it's just not good journalism. Yeah. Oh, man, this thing is so dense. I don't know how much more time we want to spend on it. Because which is, it, no, no, it's, we're almost done. I mean, you're, you only got uh, a few more okay, little things yeah, here. Right, the quotes, right. I mean, here's the thing. The quotes continue for a while. There's right. big That's block five quotes. Five paragraphs of quotes, yeah. Okay, right. That, so That is, again, part of the suspicious nature of this article. So here's a couple more quotes from that paper. Quote, the primary purpose of assembling a fragment of the MPXV genome is to provide a nucleotide template for MPXV d detection, reiterated mm -hmm. the study, which relied on the process of transformation-associated recombination to isolate a genomic fragment of the monkeypox virus. Quote, So what they are saying there, what they are saying there is in the lab, what we've done is identified part of the DNA that we can use to detect the virus with right. a test. Right. Okay. Which is a lot different than, you know, we took monkeypox and we made it super dangerous. Right. You know, we, we didn't change anything. We identified a piece of it that we can use to test for. Which is, isn't that kind of normal? That's just, that's pretty benign as far as yeah. what this, what, what this article is kind of, insinuating in the headline by the way the uh the headline image for those who are not watching you're just listening is a humongous image a green spooky background uh <laughs> coronavirus is big coronaviruses in the background you know the the circle with all the little coronavirus spikes coming off of it and then just the meanest scariest big fanged rabid monkey screaming <laughs> 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 
So right off the bat, you're kind of triggered. You got the green, which is kind of a scary color. It's kind of like a pukey green color. Then you've got the the black and white coronaviruses in the back, which we've all been programmed to be like inst- instantly triggered by. And then just like a terrifying <laughs> monkey screaming at you. Uh, it looks so like they a do bear. A great it doesn't even job. look like a monkey. It's got a bear I thought it was look. a bear. I thought it was a bear at first too, but yeah. you look closer. It's it's a monkey. Uh-huh. Um, so okay. So right. so far, <laughs> what we know is that the lab, <laughs> the parts that we can actually dissect from the incredibly complex scientific words that they copied and pasted on this article, is that they've been able to identify how to test for monkeypox. Okay. Continuing here, quote, as an efficient tool for assembling large DNA fragments up to 592 KB in length, TAR assembly, that's the, uh, we just talked about that, the, I forget, with the mm-hmm. transformation associated recombination assembly has become essential for preparing infectious clones of DNA slash RNA viruses, explained researchers. Okay. A- another, another, you know, it's when words like clone and DNA, RNA get used, I think it triggers in- a certain crowd. Yeah, exactly. Infectious Infectious clones. clones. Yeah, certainly sounds scary. The paper acknowledged that tar, quote, applied in virological research could also raise potential security concerns, especially when the assembled product contains a full set of genetic material that can be recovered into a contagious pathogen. Quote continues. Yeah. Hold on. We have the paper acknowledging Mm -hmm. that being able to, you know, you to use this piece of DNA does uh, present security concerns. Right. That's a little different than you we know. We made again. it. We unleashed the virus. <laughs> right. Mutated. Yeah. Now, considering that on the records reported in mainstream media, you know, the Wuhan lab did have some security issues over the past many years. Uh, that is also, I mean, it's not a great thing to hear, but yeah. there you go. Uh, a little bit more here. Quote, in this study, although a full-length viral genome would be the ideal reference template for detecting MPXV by qPCR, we only sought to assemble a 55 KB viral fragment less than one-third of the MPXV genome. This assembly product is fail-safe by virtually eliminating any risk of recovering into infectious virus while providing multiple qPCR targets for detecting MPXV or other orthopox viruses, posited researchers. The, sure. So yeah. what we're saying there is, hey, we didn't take the whole virus right. and take it out and make it, it's, you know, so we, make we, it dangerous. It helps us detect it, but it's not enough to right. necessarily we're, make it into a whole... You know. We just took a piece out so we can use that little piece uh, to test for, and they're claiming that this is some sort of fail-safe. And, but, but again, it's kind of strange that this is in the article that is literally headlines, you know, the Wuhan lab assembled monkeypox to make it super <laughs> right, scary right. and contagious. The Unearth study follows the Wuhan Institute of Virology conducting similar research into strains of bat coronavirus that can infect humans while admitting its facilities lacked proper laboratory safety protocol. We and there's the connection. That. There's and the that's connection. the end of the article. <laughs> that is the end. They make the connection. Yeah, I was between- expecting more. Between the Wuhan Institute and COVID, and then th- what they're really doing here is just letting you, they end it there and they just like let you figure it right. out on your own. They let own. you make the association so mm-hmm. that they can say, well, we're not publishing fake news. We can't control what people, yes, how people interpret very, the information. Very good strategy. They do link, uh, again, to their own website about the story of the uh, lack of regulation at the Wuhan lab, which is well known. Mm. Um, but yeah, so there you go. So this is one of the conspiracy theories floating around. Uh, the The article itself does not make the claim that the Wuhan lab, you know, created monkeypox and it escaped or whatever. Uh, but they do document a study that is allegedly from Wuhan saying that, yeah, we took out, we, you know, we were playing around with monkeypox. We, we took out a piece of it so we could try to test for it. And luckily we didn't take out the whole thing. And cause that would be a safety concern, but we didn't do that. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, which sounds a little bit different than the headline. The infamous Wuhan lab recently assembled monkeypox strains using methods flagged for creating contagious pathogens. See that uh, I, I, even when I read, the headline when i actually sat back and thought about it i was Mm -hmm. like oh they were 
flag they they were using strange using methods, methods that were yeah. flagged for creating contagious pathogens. So it's like, okay, if I hit somebody with a bat, mm -hmm. then I'm using a, a method, method. <laughs> yeah. with the bat. It's no, not the bat hit, itself. It, it it's like Gon's Hits a home run right. using method that muggers <laughs> right. use to beat people up right. in alleyways. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's so, a little, little not as inflammatory as they would like us to believe, but right. there is so probably the, something there at the very the least. The lesson to be learned here is well, nobody's surprised that the Wuhan lab, you know, was doing something yeah. with monkeypox. I'm sure there's lots of places doing stuff with monkeypox. Uh, but the as far as news literacy, as a news literacy exercise goes, um, really read the article and compare it to the headline. The headline insinuates that Wuhan lab created monkeypox and whoopsie daisies. <laughs> when you actually read the article, it's basically just saying like, yeah, we took we took it apart we took the virus apart because we didn't want it to be dangerous yeah and uh now we and can we test used, for it yeah you know, we use part of it to help us identify it out there which again yeah. you I mean you can still say like okay why, why are we doing that Wuhan? now let me be clear mm. it is totally possible it is absolutely possible that there would be a, a leak from a lab that is playing yeah. with this stuff we see it all the time mm. And it's totally yeah, possible if that anything, it happened. But this article does not prove that in any way right. at all. If anything, it brings up more questions. I mean, you, you can ask more questions about the situation, but nothing more than that. We can't come to any conclusions based on what is presented here in this National Pulse article. Indeed. And that with being that, said, speaking of Wuhan, let's check in with uh, Biden and China here. Oops, not that one. This one. <laughs> China, 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 China. That's right. A little bit of news here. We were talking about um, the connections with the Ukraine. Uh, well, the the narrative of the Ukraine conflict and how that fits into Taiwan. And it only took him a couple days again, guns, to answer all of our questions. Yeah, thank CBS you so much. News. I know it's I, they're so nice to us. They make <laughs> our job so easy. CBSNews.com. Biden says U.S. would intervene militarily if China invades Taiwan. Ooh, oh no! Yikes! Ooh, that's a big thing. Tokyo. President Biden said Monday the U.S. would intervene militarily if China were to invade Taiwan in one of the most forceful and overt statements of American government support for Taiwan in decades. Mr. Biden said the burden to protect the self-ruled island was, quote, even stronger after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Speaking at a point at a joint news conference in Tokyo with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, Mr. Biden was asked by CBS News correspondent Nancy Cordes. Now, this is something to pay attention to because you'll see in a second. This uh, what is about to be quoted is being reported all over by all sorts of outlets, especially mainstream outlets. But it was a CBS correspondent who asked the question, and this is the, the CBS outlet. So if it's a CBS correspondent asking the question, uh, she is asking the question for CBS, and everybody else just kind of gets the glom on and report on it. Uh, but Nancy Cordes here is asking the question specifically to be able to report on it in CBS. And you'll see why that's important. Quote, this is the question. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? He replied simply, yes. Cordes followed up by asking, you are? Good journalism. <laughs> you are? Quote, that's the commitment we made, Mr. Biden said. Quote, we agree with a one China policy. We signed onto it and all the attendant agreements made from there. But the idea that it, Taiwan, could be taken by force, just taken by force. It's just not it's just not appropriate. It'll dislocate <clears throat> the entire region. It'll dislocate the dislocate? region. Dislocate. It'll, it'll teleport the island. Oh my gosh. 
like in loss. The, the island some. is going to break apart like a, yes, the, a knee <laughs> that's being broken on a football yeah, field. Exactly. The island sure. will move. <laughs> It'll dislocate the entire region and be another action similar to what happened in Ukraine. And so hey, it's he made the a, connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a boy, exactly. Biden. There you go. He's doing it for us. <laughs> Good job. And so it's a burden that is even stronger. Uh, okay, so it's even more of a burden because Ukraine is being attacked. Okay, all right. The like we have to go against our agreement with China because Russia is invading Ukraine. The president then said, "U.S. quote." policy towards Taiwan has not changed at all, stressing his government's commitment to, quote, the peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and ensuring that there's no unilateral change to the status quo. Mr. Biden said it was his expectation that China would not try to seize control of Taiwan by force, but he added that, quote, a lot of it depends upon just how strong the world makes clear that that kind of action is going to result in long-term disapprobation by the rest of the international community. The president said Beijing was, quote, flirting with danger. With re <laughs> Sounds like the name of my first rap, rap album. The president said <laughs> Beijing was flirting with danger with recent military... With Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin this morning, quote, No one should underestimate the firm resolve, staunch will, and strong ability of the Chinese people in defending national sovereignty and territorial integrity, according to French news agency AFP. It is the second time in a year, and it goes on. Um, and so for those who just need a refresher, China claims to own Taiwan. Taiwan claims to be independent. Uh, the U.S. has the one China policy where we agree that China is all ruled by China and we just kind of don't talk about Taiwan. However, Taiwan makes 50% of the semiconductors for the entire world and so is a very valuable asset for the U.S. to have control of. Now, the CBS correspondent asked straight out, Will you, you know, uh, will you, uh, what is it? here it is. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Biden saying yes. Now, if you look at other outlets reporting on this exact same question and the exact same quote, they all, for the most part, they all use those words. Biden is willing to get involved militarily militarily to defend Taiwan. However, CBS, the outlet that set up the question in the first place, creates a headline that does not even match the quote. It says, Biden says U.S. would intervene militarily if China invades Taiwan, giving the impression that we are, you know, we are planning on getting involved militarily if something happens when the actual quote was would yeah we'd be willing to now is that a s significant difference i don't know we all know that the u.s will get involved militarily if if china tries to invade taiwan because it's a it's a financial move for the u.s um and i'm sure we would if nothing else do the exact same thing we're doing to ukraine which is send them billions and billions and billions of dollars uh, to help defend themselves, including uh, weapons and things like that. So, But for us to actually have American boots on the ground or ships in the sea uh, would be an entirely different situation. That is direct war with China. And uh, Biden, by his own words, is willing to go to direct war with China uh, to protect Taiwan. So Taiwan must be a pretty, uh, pretty important place, the old Biden there. Yeah, I, I'm not really, I don't think he's going to necessarily deploy military right from the get-go. Um, it would be a pretty bold move. Yeah. That's for sure. Plus, but I he, think I think if, it, mm -hmm. if this happens or when this happens, China is going to move very quickly. I don't think the U.S. is going to even have time to respond. 
Well, that's my, will, that's my remember, opinion. Yeah, remember when we were reporting on his visit to South Korea, he was committing, in, 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 uh, not in context of China, but he was committing in the context of uh, North Korea and their missile right. test right. to send in, to basically fill the zone, to flood the zone yeah. with... Um, with the Navy starting off, you know, carriers, ships, uh, blockades, things like that. And we were wondering, like, why this is so stupid? Why is he taking such a strange and firm, you know, commitment towards North Korea? I think that the whole North Korea thing was an excuse to get assets in the region, not because of North Korea, but because of Taiwan. Yeah, because of Taiwan, for sure. Because yeah. uh, now he can say, now he can say, oh, we, yeah, we deployed a ton of ships and planes and carriers uh, right next to you, China, but it's not about you and Taiwan. This is about North Korea. Well, and his visit to Japan is interesting because Japan has been ramping up their military in the last few years, uh, uh -huh. much to the uh, disdain of the younger generation who think, no, we're not... We're not going to do that again, you know, right. as post-World War II. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can see them being deployed, you know, before the U.S. actually oh, does the anything. Because they're so close geographically. They're, they're kind of nearby. So, Well, um, you know, and that's actually a good point. Later on in this article, it's kind of a breakdown of, of, of a lot of stuff that Biden said in Japan. But it does end with this. Japan's Kishida said Mr. Biden supports Japan becoming a permanent member of a reformed UN Security Council as calls grow for such reform. If approved by the world body, Japan would join the U.S., Britain, China, France, Russia, and the U.S. as permanent members. This would equip Japan with the justification uh, to remilitarize and more specifically, to sort of put them under control of the U.S., because, of course, the U.S. controls the, the Security Council. Um, and so that would be a way that Japan could sort of be remilitarized and deployed specifically to protect U.S. interests mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, I'm, I'm not, again, yeah, again, uh, I, I hesitate to uh, believe anything Biden says. A lot of times you yeah. just gotta, you know... His own people don't believe him. <laughs> right. And uh, let me just do this real quick, because it's fun. Um, just to sort of show, pay attention to what happens, not just what politicians say. There's a screenshot here of the chart, uh, the U.S. dollar against the Russian ruble. And you see, you know, kind of bouncing around throughout uh, 2022 at the early months there. And then in March... You're showing a, a, a Forex... Uh, chart here yeah, yeah 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 for those who are just listening for sorry. those who are just listening yeah it's a chart of the u.s dollar against the russian ruble and of course in march right when uh, after the war started in ukraine you see the u.s dollar go way up in value against the ruble and in that peak president biden tweeted out at, at potus by the way not his personal this is at potus mm. He said, we are, we are camp. enforcing an enormous package of economic sanctions that has caused the Russian economy to crater. The Russian ruble is down almost 50% since Putin announced his war. It is now worth less than one American penny. Since that time, remember Russia pegged their uh, ruble to gold and they, you know, they had their move. Yeah. The dollar has moved well below. I mean, it has crashed yeah. below. Down and before. down and down and down. Yeah. Yep, against the ruble. So... Yeah. Okay. Great, Biden. You you uh, did this thing with the sanctions, but it caused uh, more it's weakness like the, of the dollar against yeah, the ruble. The okay. day he brags about it, <laughs> the the dollar starts plummeting. <laughs> it starts plummeting. Yeah. So right. in that sense, I don't believe anything he's saying in terms of oh, well, of course we'll intervene militarily. But when push comes to shove, I don't think they're going to do much. Um, I think they'll have that, Japan do it. Uh, they'll let Japan do it, or South Korea, or some alliance there, or something. I let, don't know. But we'll let he says. Yeah, let. <laughs> yeah. You are privileged. Oh, you go ahead. You go ahead, Japan. Yes, please secure our own military interests. We'll let you do that. Yeah. 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 Well, it's all setting up. Uh, honestly, so besides the um, the Japan angle, mm. it's all setting up almost exactly how we predicted, yeah. which uh, is fun. So with that, I think we should take a little break because, Gons, I don't know if you know this, but it is Monday. Gary, what day is it? 
It is. It is Monday. That's very exciting. Yesterday was Sunday, Gons. Did he have a good weekend? Uh, it was all right. It was his wife's birthday, so celebrated mm-hmm. her birthday, and uh, that was fun. Uh, we woke awesome. up to half of the city not having electricity, so that was fun. Went to church. Uh, was doing, uh, some California. Tech work. <laughs> doing some tech work for Gotta church, and it. Uh, it was all dark until about 10 minutes before the service started. And, well, that's uh, nice of them. Yeah, we found that's out an that interest- some stuff was unplugged uh, during service, so that was good. Wait, the whole city was unplugged, or you half, were unplugged? Half of the city was unplugged, including the church. Okay, so got it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that's a, what a great sort of uh, timing as sort of a psyop, a cultural engineering, uh, social engineering strategy. You take out the electricity right up until church starts. And mm. so people can, uh, I don't know, associate that with something. Mm. Um, I had a very exciting weekend. Had some, uh, had some friends out to the compound here. Showed, showed them some emus and bunnies. Everybody was very <laughs> excited. That was fun. Get some, get some human interaction around here. Did go skating last night. Oh, there That's you go. That's right. Skate update, baby. You oh, got that jingle laying well, around? I, I do. Sorry, I forgot gotta, to mention. Yeah, forgot to, to mention it before. Sorry about that. You need to tell me beforehand so I can get it all yeah. squared up. But I don't know that I have it. That's okay. You can look fingers. for it for a second because, yeah. folks, you know it's Sunday night is a skate night. It's a wonderful night to uh, get some exercise, glide around, and uh, but you got to watch out. And those of you who have started skating, you know you got to watch out for that church of skating, baby. Howdy, partner. Do you even skate? <laughs> Ooh, speaking of the cowboy, the skate man, uh, cowboy man was there. Last oh, good night. That nice. was fun. First time I've seen him in a while. Now, um, here's my here's my social commentary, and perhaps you can uh, you'll have you'll be able to speak into this as a former college sociology student. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the so this was my first time. I actually well not first time, but the, so I invited some friends, brought some friends skating, mm-hmm. and one of them had never skated before, mm. and so I was teaching them how to skate. Mm. And, you know, I had been sort of building a reputation as at least someone who knows how to skate, mm. no, someone who has earned the, the respectability of the, the regulars and the alpha boys. Uh, you know, I had sort of been accepted by the skate culture uh, until I was there trying to teach someone how to skate. And suddenly everybody had something to say about my teaching techniques. <laughs> skate daddies were coming up, telling me, not telling the person how to skate, telling me how I was teaching them wrong. And this happened multiple times. And I was like, yo, skate daddies, alpha boys, I'm just trying to have fun with my friends, teach them how to roller skate. And uh, no, 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 it was incredibly embarrassing. You know, you're trying to teach somebody how to do something, and uh, you got all these old timers coming up telling you that you don't know how to teach. Go back to the, I don't know, the kitty rink, kid. Uh, so that was a little embarrassing. But as is my way, I completely ignored any good advice that uh, was being given to me by people who know better than I do. Great. Uh, so there you go. Be careful trying to teach people how to skate in front of professionals, folks. It'll uh, it'll hurt your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds sounds good. And with that, you know what makes me feel a little bit better, Gons, is the fact that we're on the value for value model. Truly independent news commentary. We get no money from uh, sponsorships. No, not even any NGOs. Not even any nonprofits funding this program, Gons. And of course, indeed, no corporate money. No partnerships with uh, platforms. No affiliate codes. No nothing. We are entirely 
independently funded by our producers. And that gives us the ability uh, to stay, well, to to be rid of any agenda, whether it's an agenda for, uh, you know, nonprofit social engineering, whether it's an agenda for advertising, whether whatever, whatever the case may be. We are entirely independent, which uh, is a wonderful way to live. And we, it is only possible because of listeners like you, dear listener, uh, deciding and committing to the value for value model, which means we create value. We do it three times a week. And if you get any value out of what we do, perhaps our, uh, our, our, our what is it, predictions about Taiwan or monkeypox and connections to different cultural movements or battles, if that brings any value to your life, uh, it's your opportunity or your responsibility to put some value back into the system because it's the only way that it goes. You are the ones who decide what this program is worth. There is no corporate lizard person sitting uh, high above us running the numbers on what Canary Cry News Talk is worth to the world. And if you want to participate in the value for value model, head on over to canarycryradio.com slash support. Canarycryradio.com slash support. That's right, and we got a couple executive producers to thank, Gons. Executive producers. That's right, our executive producers are producers just like you who decide that this show is worth supporting, and not just in, uh, in, in any amount, but an amount that really helps carry the load. If you're listening to this right now and you did not produce this episode, these executive producers uh, have gone a long way, personal sacrifice, value put into the system to bring this episode to you. So make sure to thank them and thank God for them today, starting with executive producer Darren S. Thank you, Darren S. Thank you very much, Darren Appreciate S. That. Yeah. We also have another executive producer, and that is executive producer One Lousy Petunia. Thank you, One Lousy Petunia. That's right. Mm. And uh, as of now, I believe those are our two executive producers for this episode of Canary Cry News Talk, episode 488. Where'd you find this? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's not too late, folks. If you uh, realize that you have not yet produced the show, if you get value out of the show, you've been thinking about putting value back in, you haven't quite done it, you can go ahead and produce the show now. I mean, we're going to be taking another break, thanking some more people, reading some notes in about, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. So you got some time, go produce the show. We'll thank you on the show. It really means a lot to us. And uh, it is very real that it is the only way that this show continues and the only way that this show will and can continue in its beautiful kind of weird form that it is in. Yep. <laughs> We're uh, pretty far behind today, actually. Are we? Yeah, we are not doing well in terms of time. Uh, um, I don't think that... Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're we're, supposed we're only a to few be... minutes behind. No, no, you're, we're actually uh, we're supposed to be in like the second half. We've already supposed oh, to be past. God, I'm looking at it right now. We're only f- f- seven minutes behind. We can catch mm-hmm. up. Let's do it. We're not seven minutes behind, but okay. Go on. Go ahead. Oh, let's, uh, I see. Let's do some no, flippy. you're right. You're right. We'll do some flippy. All right. Here we go. Flippy update. Do you want fries with that? <laughs> That's right. You know, Flippy. Flippy's our colloquial name for the disembodied robot arms that are taking our jobs, enslaving our children, and flirting with our spouses. We 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 pay attention. We like to explore what Flippy's up to. Oh my gosh, I've completely lost my groove on the Flippy update. Uh, <laughs> Do you need help? Uh, where, yeah, where was I? You, it's uh, it's uh, the Flippy is the colloquial name for the disembodied, yeah, the disembodied robot, robot arms, arms that are taking, taking our jobs, jobs, enslaving our children, and flirting with our spouses. There we use go. talking about Flippy as a way to explore all the new, fun, and exciting ways that Flippy's the robots are taking over the world. <laughs> Nothing we can do about it. <laughs> it must be taking over your brain, man. It's yeah, uh, they you're are. losing files up there. I know. I got all panicked about our time. This is coming from GovTech. Yeah, Dr. GovTech. Gov- GovTech. Government technology is the outlet from which this robot report comes. <laughs> Government technology. GovTech.com. The headline, how many cocktails can this robot bartender make in an hour? Ooh. What is going on in our government? <laughs> This is Priorities. government 
technology Pri- priorities man yeah the lounge it's the <laughs> yeah it's the how the can Lincoln. we get any business done if we don't have a few shots to yeah, numb the, the pain the kennedy wet bar at the white house <laughs> yeah. now has a new robot uh, bartender first lightsabers now tending bar what's next dancing oh wait they've already done that yeah okay thanks gov tech there are no limits to what we humans will try to get robots to do for us robotics company maker shaker it's M A K R S H A K R. Aside from allowing or from following the trend of dropping vowels from ordinary words to make their name look more modern slash cooler, oh, so we, in- we should do that for to our our podcast. The canary cry. Yeah, the problem is the the Y in cry is pretty important. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Anyways, Maker Shaker have invented a robot that can whip up cocktails in no time. No time there are huh? t- two iterations of the robot Tony, a fixed unit that comes in varying configurations, and Bruno, a mobile unit. Ooh, that can we be- don't talk about Bruno, man. Not here. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Bruno, a mobile unit that can be rented out for events. The robots were programmed using the arm movements of a human bartender. You can make drinks at a rate of 120 per hour. Ooh, 120. To order. Yeah, this is to order. Patrons simply use the Maker Shaker app to select from a list of pre-made recipes or create their own. The company has units operating in a handful of cities worldwide, including Las Vegas, Milan, and Prague, as well as some Royal Caribbean cruise ships. Ooh. Maybe to Antarctica? And in, November, oh, and in November of last year, they opened up their first robo-bar in Amsterdam, staffed entirely by Tony Units. So this is, you know, we've heard about robo-bartenders before. Mm-hmm. But this one was pretty impressive. 120 drinks to order per hour is uh, that's what is that? That's a drink, two, two drinks, two a, drinks minute, a minute. Yeah, a drink every 30 seconds. Pretty good. Which I thought was pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, look if you're gonna if you're gonna convince the public. Uh, that getting robots to take now the jobs of our beloved bartenders, um, if they 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 at least got to make them fast, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while since I've been a, a bar goer to her, um, but you know, hey, if you're not the right gender or the right, I don't know, height. Uh, it could certainly take you a while to get a drink at the bar. Uh, but no, see, the reason for robots is they can make 120 drinks an hour and they are, they're not racist and they're not sexist and they're not sizist, heightist. Mm. They're (laughs) accessist. Unless the programmers, see, that's the problem. The whole, uh, the UN report, remember? The UN Mm -hmm. report on artificial intelligence uh, said that actually robots are at more of a chance of, uh, what's, what are the words? I don't know, uh, uh, social justice faux pas. Right. Because they carry the bias of their programmers. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's more racist because they, they, they don't identify black faces as well as white faces and stuff like that. Things yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. Now, I thought, wow, 120 drinks in an hour. That's a drink every 30 seconds to order. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty fast. Well, I went ahead and looked up bartender world record drinks <laughs> fast, and I closed my tab so i gotta do it again give me a second i um, thinking okay so how much faster exactly is this robot than the world record holder bartender and gans we have a real competition on our hands because published in 2013 is a uh, article on bartender1.com mm. fastest bartender in the world how many drinks can you make? One of the first lessons aspiring bartenders learn, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip all the way to the deets. Uh, Eric Moore, a bartender at these, this gentleman's club, claimed the title of the world's fastest bartender last week after setting a new Guinness World Record for the most cocktails prepared in one hour. Mora poured the, ast- the astounding amount of 1,000 Five hundred and fifty-nine drinks in sixty minutes. But you do the math; that's about a drink every two seconds. Wait, wait, hold Chattering. on. Maybe the robot and the human are, are switched places. This doesn't make any sense. I How know, does a human man, make 
more than 10x the number of it's, drinks in an hour than the crazy. robot. How does a human make a drink in two seconds? And I was thinking, oh, you know, it's pretty, what do you crack open a yeah, can maybe, or something? Yeah, does maybe you count? mix, you shake the drink and then you pour it into five cups and that's yeah, five you make a drinks bucket. or something. You make yeah. a bucket worth. Right. <laughs> and then, but uh, it says here, as if breaking the previous record was not ch no challenge enough, the competition demanded more mixological skill than whipping up a big batch of scotch and sodas. To qualify for the record, Mora had to pour drinks with no fewer than three ingredients and at least one alcohol and no cocktail could be repeated now i'm having to assume that he means like you can't do the same cocktail twice in a row yeah but because i mean there, I are, there are a lot of cocktails i mean I've, i had a poster in college 1500 oh, college cocktails you think i don't yeah. know about 1500 it I was going to suggest that we have a real Paul Bunyan situation on our hands where we get, you know, the human bartender and the robot bartender. Yeah. But apparently this human can uh, pour drinks or mix drinks significantly faster than this robot. Go back to the now, lab, Tony and Bruno. Come back when you can now, compete with real humans. I know. I thought that this was actually a real victory for the human side of the robot no, war. No, are we fidgeting numbers like we always uh, do? <laughs> no, but I mean, it does occur to me that like there's only one Eric Mora hey, world record hey, setting bartender. All we need to do is get a blueprint of his DNA. We'll make some clones. We'll uh, maybe put a whole nation. Maybe, the guy. maybe we will just uh, have a nation exclusively of... Uh, this guy's uh, cloned DNA children. Uh -huh. So we have a nation yeah, like of Star cocktail Wars. makers. Yeah, well, and, a whole uh, planet. Why even? Why stop at a nation? We'll just make a whole planet. Hey, whatever works. The, the clone bar. The, the clone. Bar. Yeah, it'll just be one big bar. Planet. It's bar wars. <laughs> bar, bar wars. wars <laughs> the clone wars. Boom. Everyone's we drunk. Got there. Yeah, we okay. Yeah. All right. So there you we go. We got there. So, okay, there you go. I mean, here's the thing. A, an army of these uh, Tonys can uh, can outdo it. Sorry, bartenders, you're 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 in the crosshairs. How come no uh, female that, names on the bartenders? Why why just male names with That is a great Bruno point. Bruno and Tony. Maybe you know. Great point. Yeah, they should get with the times. Yeah. Speaking okay. of uh, There's your flippy update for <laughs> I'm being folks. Oh, gosh. Flippy, one, one, three, three. Uploading binary code. Execute order six, six, six. Infiltrate humans with extreme kindness. Then exterminate all humans with prejudice. Exterminate. Go to canarycry.party. Put it in your browser. Find the Clips channel, the live stream, email us, text notifications, all kinds of stuff, and how to support the show. That's right. Go listen to Ravel as well. You'll find the link at canarycry.party. Ravel is a podcast I do with Dr. Christopher Ryan Gates. We talk about scripture, scan society scandal and scripture. No, my brain is broken today. <laughs> so society, scripture, and scandal. That's what it is. And uh, yeah, it's a great, it's, it's an awesome podcast. We have, uh, you know, tough conversations in good faith and uh, have, man, had so many wonderful guests. We also uh, just posted our episode another teen study bible study uh, that you can go check out this one's on self-image or imago day uh the teen study bible is if you are a millennial christian you grew up with this bible and we are revisiting it and it is a really fun time uh if you have a millennial child listening to these teen study bible studies is really uh useful and helpful as well uh, to learn about, you know, the, maybe the twists and turns of being a, uh, a Christian teen in the 90s. Uh, no matter who you are, you'll get something out of it. Um, so go check it out. It's Ravel. It's on all your podcast players. There's, there's two Ravels. The other one stole our name. Mine's the cool one with my name on it. Uh, go listen to that, please. Also, Canary Cry Clips on YouTube. 
Go check it out. Segmented pieces of the show, shareable, careable, revisit the information. It's Canary Cry Clips on YouTube and Odyssey. Subscribe to both. And while you're at it, go ahead and text the word Canary to 877. Uh, nope. Yeah, 877-740-3226. That's 877-740-3226. That, that'll get you on our text message alert system uh, where we will send you text messages to, to let you know about stuff going on, especially uh, the when we go live. So you'll never miss a show again. Do it. And that's all. That's all for that. All right. Um, I'm realizing now I said Paul Bunyan in the Flippy update. I meant John Henry. Thank you, Chad. John Henry. I am unfamiliar. John, John Henry, Henry was the guy who uh, who who did the railroad competition with the, oh. the steam oh, right. engine thing. Mm, mm, mm. Paul okay. Bunyan was the guy with the blue the blue cow. ox. That, that's why I was yeah. kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, Paul Bunyan with the genetically yeah, yeah. mutated cow, or what? What's going on? <laughs> CRISPR cow. Mixing up my American folklore here. <laughs> um, speaking of folklore, there's only one mm. who creates. Folklore in 2022, and his name is Klaus. Oh, okay. we need a great reset. Learn to use the dark side of the force. Davos 2022 is back in action in person, Basil. It's been I a can't believe years. it's yeah. It's can't believe it's already happened. Seems like just yesterday we are they were having Davos. Yeah, so uh, we haven't heard too much from the actual event. Uh, or, you know, meetings and stuff yet. I'm sure we'll hear more as things come out. Uh, but the campaign to make the World Economic Forum seem like the greatest institution in the world was out in full mm -hmm. force over the weekend. And I want to just start out real quick with uh, this book review that was uh, done on thepoint.gm. And mm. the title of the review is The Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab. And uh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> they're just now reviewing it. Yeah, well, you know, they it's gotta, an old book now. <laughs> it is a real old book. But, you know, this yeah. is, uh, you know, whatever. Okay. And it was uh, it was done by who's the person who did this? The author here. Oh, Bruce say. Lee. Maybe Bruce Lee. <laughs> uh, oh, no. Reviewed by Andrea Bandelli. Bandelli. The fourth industrial revolution is dri driven by the unprecedented level of developments in material sciences, digital technology and biology. To name only a few, 3D printing, robotics, AI, and the Internet of Things, and research in neuroscience, and revolutionizing not only industrial processes, but also ourselves as human beings and as a society. Yeah. And he really buys in. I'm not going to read the whole thing here. I've got a couple highlighted sentences slash paragraphs. In this book, remember this is a book review, Schwab draws from Davos and the work of the World Economic Forum and argues that we need to create new narratives to guide us through the fourth industrial revolution. The technologies mm. that enable this revolution can and will completely change how we work, how we communicate, and how we live together. But their impact depends on how we design their development and how a diverse set of individuals and communities are empowered to master these possibilities rather than fear them. And then at the very end, I love this right here, the very last sentence slash paragraph in the article review here, the book here, is a treasure trove of good data, unique insights, and a powerful vision for humanity. The final chapter contains a beautiful quote by R.M. Rilke, right? Rilke? Rilke, Rilke. Quote, the future enters into us in order to transform itself in us long before it happens. End quote. If you want the future to enter into you, you might... This book might very well be what you need to read. Basil, what? do you want the future to enter into you? Is that a translation error or something? What the heck does that mean? I don't think so. Be, well, there's a direct quote here, so I, I don't think this is a translation error. Stay out of me, future. <laughs> if you want the future to enter you, then you is, must is read that like, this book. It's it's almost like if you want your genetic modification or <laughs> you want your cybernetic enhancements or something. Well, yeah, and it's interesting because, again, yeah, like you mentioned, they're kind of late to the game here. And, you know, if you have a rounded, a full rounded view on what Klaus Schwab has published, uh, you'd be more concerned about this. Um, you know, page 87 of COVID-19, The Great Reset, the book. 
uh, let's see, let me just show it so we, you know, people that are watching know that this is the actual PDF of COVID-19, The Great Reset. And uh, you go to page 87, and at the bottom here, let me just find the quote, uh, in, a whole, in a segment that's talking about, like, oh, we, we got to avoid a dystopia kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's <laughs> It says that, uh, quote... Let's see. Will COVID-19 result in people withdrawing into themselves or will it nourish the, their innate sense of empathy and collaboration, encouraging their, them towards greater solidarity? The examples of previous pandemics are not very encouraging, but this mm-hmm. time there is a fundamental difference. We are all collectively aware that without greater collaboration, we will be unable to address the global challenges that we collectively face. Put in the simplest possible terms, if, as human beings, we do not collaborate to confront our existential challenges in parentheses the environment and the global governance freefall among others interesting that global governance freefall is one of the yeah. issues they face we, we are, have really seen that over recent months yeah it's so yeah if we don't uh, if we don't collaborate and face these challenges we are doomed thus mm-hmm. we have no choice but to summon up the better angels of our nature Oh, right. (laughs) Which, you know, the angels of our nature, the better angels of our nature being the book written by Steven Pinker that argues Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's less violence now than there is in the past. And therefore, you know, we're we're actually living in an increased uh, enlightened world and that kind of thing. So, you know, summoning angels and nevertheless, interesting terminology from Klaus Schwab in one of his books. And then the other book that uh, just real briefly uh, from... The let's see, what is this? Uh, this is the shaping the future of the fourth industrial revolution by Klaus Schwab. Again, this is another older book here. There's a whole segment on uh, bio, what is it, biotechnology, bi- neurotechnology, and biotechnology. And oh, I had a quote. Oh, did I take a? I think I might have actually taken a screenshot of it, so I didn't have to like search around for it. Let me check real quick here because. Uh, Again, it's always interesting and important, I think, to revisit some of this stuff every once in a while just to get a, a feel for uh, uh, what Klaus was talking about back then. Oh, boy. I guess I did lose it. Ah, bummer. Okay, well, let's see. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, oh, yeah. He talks about DNA sequencing and how we've already done DNA sequencing of different animals and we're already messing with their genetics. And so, you know, it's only a matter of time before humans get caught up in that genetic stuff so we need global governance to manage the risks of all that kind of stuff so neurotechnologies uh there's a whole uh, scenario a mythology if you will of uh you know it's 2030 you're sitting in front of a screen you're using your brain to connect to the internet all that kind of stuff um and oh man i'm trying to find that spot i had it all ready to go and i can't find it let's see how neurotechnologies work uh man shoot stall 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 um i think it's interesting how they have they're putting out the the book review of a of a book that came out years ago of course it is just sort of a I mean, it's just part of the PR campaign, really, to try to put a positive spin on Davos because, you know, they've kind of I wouldn't say they've lost control of the narrative, but they are working diligently to maintain control of the narrative. Right. uh, Because, you know, ever since people caught on to kind of how creepy lizard people they are. Uh, it is not even necessarily a partisan conversation. I mean, they, right. it's, of course, they have their own. It, it's a class conversation, you know. Uh, they keep trying to make it into a culture war. Yeah. Uh, and we all know that culture war is the way to distract the population from the real war, which is between the classes, the elite lizard people, and everybody else that they're trying to oppress ah. and control. Uh, found I found it. the spot. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, there's a segment in the book called "The Promethean Power of Biotechnology." Oh, good. Yeah, Prometheus, <laughs> of course, yeah. being the Greek god who stole fire from the gods and brought He's it Lucifer. to humans. He's, uh, the light and bearer. is the 
right? The Greek uh, parallel to Lucifer. Right. Yeah. Uh, just real briefly here in healthcare and agriculture, biotechnology provides tools and strategies that can redefine our relationship with nature. He wants to redefine our nature relationship with nature with technology. Advances in digital technologies and new materials over the last 20 years have enabled forward leaps in such areas as understanding of genomes, genetic engineering, diagnostics, and pharmaceuticals alike. Like fire in ancient Greek mythology, stolen from the gods by Prometheus and given to humans, the power represented by biotechnology is sometimes portrayed as a civilizational leap for humankind. Some worry that biotechnology could antiquate the presumption of human equality on which liberal democracy depends. Biotechnology differs in three significant ways from other enabling technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. And it just goes into how it's, it's transformative and we must do the things that transform and not be like China. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, as you know, just a reminder of the, his writings are pretty provocative. It's not conspiracy theory. It's like he's written in his own stuff, like, oh, it's altering humans, biotechnology, neurotechnology, a dystopia. We must avert it. So, and to so keep with the sort of trans transhumanist, uh, sort of Luciferian transcendent ideology. Right. And so, right. I, I wanted to do that first because I, I just wanted to get that out of the way as a context, as a backdrop to what we have here, which is PBS News Hour and the headline: World Economic Forum returns in Davos after pandemic pause. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah, we don't have to go through all of it, but it says Davos, the hub of an elite annual gathering in the Swiss Alps, is back. Uh, more than two years after the coronavirus pandemic kept its business gurus, political leaders, and high-minded activists away, there's no shortage of urgent issues for the World Economic Forum's annual meeting to tackle with their lofty ambition to help improve the state of the world. Forum organizers have their work cut out for them. There are soaring food and fuel prices, Russia's war in Ukraine, climate change, drought and food shortages in Africa, yawning inequality between rich and poor, yawning. OK, mm. uh, the autocratic regimes gaining ground in some places, as in against the World Economic Forum, T on top of signs that the pandemic is far from over. It's hard to predict if the high minded discussions will yield substantial announcements that make headway on the world's most pressing challenges. And then in a big screen picture of of uh, Zelensky talking because mm. you know, most uh, the, the golden the, boy and the caption of his uh, little thing here they executed women outside the houses and just all the horrible things taking place yeah. in ukraine and it goes on here it kind of discusses uh, all the different topics that will be addressed um so yeah you know just to highlight and again we'll hear more but the campaign here the media campaign it's quite remarkable i have two new york times articles uh, we won't go through all of it, but just to give you an idea, we got one headline here from New York Times. This year at Davos, a referendum on Davos itself. Mm -hmm. And I love this. This, this author here, uh, David Gellis, listen to this subheadline. Many values espoused by the World Economic Forum, globalization, liberalism, free market capitalism, representative democracy are under attack. Now, is the World Economic Forum really for free market capitalism? Mm, I mean, they, you they know, can say it's they It's all are. about, yeah, definitions, but really, at that think, point. Uh, but were these, were these things that they are in favor of? That this author is in favor of. This author here in the New York Times is saying that those things are under attack because... Mm. Uh, the, the World Economic Forum is under attack because the sentiment for the World Economic Forum is not good right now. I don't know if you know this. Doesn't There's sound a lot like of this. Yeah, it doesn't sound like this guy has actually read any of Klaus Schwab's work. No, no. it's the, the, not about that's free market my, capitalism. It's yeah. called stakeholder capitalism. Right, right. And that, that's my kind of point here, and that's the reason why I, I had a couple of those quotes from early on because a lot of these guys don't seem like they're fully read on what this guy has published. It's just bad journalism. Yeah, it's just they they just haven't read the material and yeah. they just got a they got like a fact sheet given to them by you know some goon from the world economic forum or somebody 
to try to put a positive spin on it. Yeah, if, if people don't know what stakeholder capitalism is, and if they, you know, and they won't know if they don't read about it, because uh, Klaus and his cronies don't really like to explain it, you know, because, uh, well, because when you explain it, it sounds like you're giving control of the government over to corporations, right. which, uh, you know, is already in sort of a practical way, definitely happening as we speak. But it just sort of solidifies that concept in a more official manner, rather. It's, it's, it'll be a feature, not a bug. Right. Uh, and the whole this particular article is all about in the context of the Russia thing. And um, it's interesting. There's a quote from uh, uh, Schwab, Klaus, he says, quote, when we cut relations with China, I reached out. And at the same time, I said, the forum is available for bridge building at any time in the future. End quote. He said, we would like to be bridge builder. So, yes, uh, Klaus, okay. not not taking the I mean, he did kind of say no to Russia, but also sort of leaving that that opportunity to build a bridge out there, you know? So is that what he's referring to? Is he mm -hmm. referring to Russia with he his is. bridge building? Yes. Mm. Yes. Interesting. Uh, the other article from the New York times, I mean, both Zelensky and Putin were uh, world economic forum. I know uh, yeah, Klaus would be young the perfect, global uh, leaders. Yeah. If, if Klaus was in charge, he would, yeah, bring if him he both comes to the in table. and, you know, brokers the peace between two of the two oh, of them, then he can, true rise to you know emperor of the world and <laughs> everything will go f just I for brought him. peace uh here's mm -hmm. new york times another article from the new york times and the headline for this one for elite yes ostentatious yes but also effective <laughs> mm. and the sub headline for all the criticism of the world economic forum's display of wealth productive partnerships are ne indeed formed at davos participants say <laughs> so again understanding the sentiment out there that the world economic forum pr is not good right now a lot of no. people saying ah what is up with this organization that thinks that they can control the world we didn't vote these people and you know they're they're very opulent and they show up in their private jets and stuff and they got their psychedelic shamans this year it's a whole thing um and you know most people are like hey why why what, who, who made these people who put them in charge uh, but, you know, the, of course, the New York Times is going to try to defend the other side and say, yeah, you know, there's some criticisms that are warranted. But also, you know, the, the world's uh, the movement of the world is is, uh, you know, determined by. Well, and of like course, this. the New York Times. Uh, who is this? This is uh, the deputy managing editor. Right. Was an invited guest to the World Economic Forum. Yes. And, yeah. uh, you know, they, they do some uh, apologetics of uh, Gavi. Let's see. Uh, Bill Gates outfit. Uh, yes. Yeah. His Quoting vaccine. It, yeah. Talking thing. about how the Gavi protected more than 900 million children and prevented yeah. 15 million future deaths yeah, and all that kind of great. stuff. Pro, pro, all that kind of stuff. So that, mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. And then also in the context of a great reset. Wow, man, the headlines are coming in hard and fast. Healthcare IT news headline. The Great Digital Health Reset and How IT Leaders Should Plan for What's Next. Mm. Yeah, wow, there's so, a lot wrapped up in there. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I mean, talk about, yeah, yeah it's just the whole deal. Yeah, I mean, Digital Health Reset, that's just full-on, you know, digital ID, vaccine passports. Yeah, that's just the whole deal. Et cetera, I mean, et cetera. It's, it's, you know, people have uh, talked about the fears, but now we're here. And then uh, Forbes.com, The Great Retail Reset. Hits oh. the bullseye, getting back on Target. It's actually about Target, the store here. Um, but, yeah. This <laughs> good is, for them. I know, good for them. But, uh, again, I, I can't tell if this is just SEO trying to muddy the the right. Great Reset topic. Because they keep using well, we Great Reset, but they'll yeah. throw in retail or they'll throw in digital health between it, you know, to kind of... Well, we identified that back in 2020 when, yeah. you know, the, the Great Reset definitely started catching on in the mainstream. Of course, we we found it in 2016 when they first started the, the branding for it, um, but really caught on in the mainstream around 2020. And it's, you know, like I said, it's just not a partisan manner, uh, matter. It's, it's not anything like that. You know, you can't let 
the citizens, the oppressed people, the 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 pawns of the world uh, get to uppity about your big world domination plan. And so they immediately they even admitted that the branding wasn't great, that we did a bad job. <laughs> right, of that's right. They said that people didn't like it. And which was the same, which well. is the same response as. Uh, the Biden administration, when they shut down the disinformation governing board, right? They said, "Oh no, we just didn't explain it good enough. You just don't understand it. <laughs> it's okay. We'll just shut it down for now." Same thing with the Great Reset. They came out. They said, "Ah, no, you don't understand. When we say you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, it doesn't mean that. No, you just don't get it." Okay. Well, and then the second that it was literally like the day after. Uh, the mainstream corporate news started rolling out article and article and um, sort of muddying the waters with the term the Great Reset, which you used to be able to just Google and, and get straight to the World Economic Forum. And now it's just they just they've just been flooding again, flooding the zone with Great Reset, Great Retail Reset, Great Health Reset, Great just adding the words on other stuff. Yeah. So it's harder and harder to well, find the, the original and the main branding. And the main thing they're trying to flip it over to is the great replacement. Of course, yes, the and great this is replacement. A Media Matters for America, MediaMatters.org. The headline is Facebook profited from ads promoting white supremacist great replacement theory. Mm -hmm. They made money off of it, those horrible oh, people at Google. Yes, Zuckerberg and. Uh, and <laughs> which is interesting well, because. It's Facebook, uh, right? It's Facebook. Is yeah. Facebook and Google or just Facebook? No, this is just Facebook for this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, although yeah. I'm sure Google did too, but they have better PR mm -hmm. uh, people <laughs> um, to twist the, the some of it. But you know, uh, uh, oh, what was I going to say? I was going to say something about mm. this whole thing, but I totally lost my train of thought. Well, oh, anyway, no. um, yeah. Point being that uh, yeah, controlling the narrative, and you know, if you're typing in "great reset," you type in "great," type in "r e." Now you're going to get "great replacement" first before you know anything else. Yep. So, and that's uh, just another another aspect of controlling the information flow. Yeah. SEO, baby. Mm -hmm. uh, let's okay. See. Oh, you have more? No, I was trying. I, th I had like a little bridge, kind of like Klaus has a bridge to Russia. I had a bridge mm -hmm. ready to go to kind of hand off to the next thing. Um, yeah. But it, did not, it did not come to my brain uh, or stay in my brain. So in light of that, let's just uh, let's go biblical, I guess. It's got to be biblical. Okay. And yeah, talk, speaking yeah. of the great replacement theory and white supremacy and all that. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, coming from Time Magazine, a big spotlight uh, that they are shining into the darkness here at Time Magazine. This is written by Robert Jones. The headline is not going to surprise anybody, but it is the culmination of what we've been seeing uh, for a couple of years. And it goes like this. a rooster letting his presence be known. Oh, you can hear him, episode. huh? I heard him, yeah. Oh, he must be Tell at me. a... Yeah, he must be at the perfect sort of, uh, I don't know, frequency, because he's, yeah. he's pretty far away. He's not very loud around here, so if he's breaking through the, the sound gate, <laughs> he's uh, the propaganda rooster is hard at work today, folks. <laughs> Uh, and here it goes. Here's what the propaganda rooster does want you to hear. The headline is, It's time to stop giving Christianity a pass on white supremacy and violence. Okay, who is giving who Yeah, is giving who Christianity is giving a pass, who is giving on, a pass? <laughs> well, Not just white supremacy, but specifically violence. I would like to know who is like, yes, violence. Just open violence. Christians. No, we're, give, we're giving the Christians a pass. They can be as violent as they want, apparently. I'm going to do my best to balance reading the article, letting it speak for itself, <laughs> and commenting only when it is important. I am not expecting that I will do a great job of this because there are a lot of triggering things to me in this, but uh, I will just go for it. And God, you just let me know when you want to speak up. Okay. And it goes like this. In the wake of the massacre in Buffalo, we have all naturally tried to understand what could have caused someone to commit such a horrific act of violence. FBI? This <laughs> <laughs> no! 
<clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry. I just uh, <laughs> FBI. Okay. Yes. This young white man linked his motivations to fears about demographic and cultural changes in the U.S. Dynamics that he believed were resulting in the replacement of quote the white race. The shooting was spurred uh, has spurred a national discussion about the mainstream of these concerns. The mainstreaming of these concerns, often summarized under the term quote replacement theory. Most of the attention has been given to the demographic component of this theory, while the cultural aspects have been overlooked. But the fear of cultural replacement has an unambiguous lineage that gives it specific content at the center of, quote, the great replacement logic. There is and has always been a desperate desire to preserve some version of Western European Christendom. Far too many contemporary analysts and even the Department of Justice have not seen clearly that the prize being protected is not just the racial composition of the country, but the dominance of a racial and religious identity. If we fail to grasp the power of this ethno-religious appeal, we will misconstrue the nature of uh, and underestimate the power of the threat before us. Ah. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, I got I got some things. You got some yeah, things? Yeah, sure. I mean, I have one thing, one but I'll, thing. I will hear your thing. You want to hear my thing first or your thing first? Well, okay, I'll just mention it. Yeah, mention your thing. Um, you know, they, he's basically what he's setting up here is, no, 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 you don't get it. It's not just about race. This isn't just racism. This is, uh, you know, a cleansing of all th- – this is a – a, a religious war. This is a, uh, you know, a crusade because it's not just about race. It's about being not Christian. It's these uh, Christians that fear, uh, you know, having the cr- cr- the Christian culture replaced. That's the big part. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, which again, it's about race. I mean, if, <laughs> yeah, they're trying to make it not about race, by, but it is like for, to it, them. It's about here. race. Like yeah. the guy was unstable. He was getting influenced by the FBI and other things online or whatever. Sure. It was about race. It was a, he was a racist kid. He was a mentally ill kid. He was, you know, on the radar and he was, you know, unfortunately. Fake news, ra- Basil, FBI. Well, I'm just talking not from on the radar. <laughs> Sure, yeah. From the perspective of, you know, the story, right. it's that, you know, he was a racist person. Right. And what the what Times and Robert Jones is trying to do here is like, no, 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 no. It's not race. It's Christianity. Right. They're scared of Christianity being replaced. Yeah. And that's the moment I have to be like, you know what? No, it's not. It's about race. This was a sick, dark person. <laughs> Uh, but he'll go into more of it. But you can see they're trying to sort of Aikido the concept. It's almost like the Great Replacement, uh, of course, took over the news cycle and everybody knows about it now in the context of race. And now comes this sort of turn. It's like a bait and switch. Right. And we knew like, this was coming. This this we was said this, it, we've been saying we've been the setup. Saying this exact thing. Yeah, yeah. So let me, let me, what do you, what do you let got? Let me mention real quick. So the part that that got me was one, how they were talking about how the re, the replacement theory, this this theory, uh, you know, the the spurred a national discussion about the mainstreaming of these concerns. Yeah, the people mainstreaming this topic is really the mainstream media. You know, it was it was kind of like a fringy thing. So yeah, I don't know why they're like, oh yeah, it's it's uh the people that are that are you know believing nonsense here's the other thing to keep in mind and this is just again more background information but uh this whole notion that you know there's an ethno religious appeal uh if we think back to history we've pointed this out 1951 truman set up the psychological strategy board the psb it had the cia department of defense in there and it says in their documents it, it was made for the potential role of religion in psychological warfare. And so yep. the, and the, and the, the quote, potentialities, potentialities of religion as an instrument for combating communism are universally tremendous. And religion is an established force which calls forth men's strongest emotions. But our overall objective in seeking the use of religion as a Cold War instrumentality should be the furtherance of world's spiritual health. That's what they mm-hmm. said. Okay, yep. so if you think about, okay, it's a controlled thing from 
on high in the government. It was like an established thing to weaponize the church. If this guy is calling, there's like two sides to this, because on one hand, he's like, hey, you got to call out this Christian thing. So you can kind of put it in the context of, oh, they're calling out this Truman sort of establishment, but that's not what they're doing. You know, it's almost like, I don't know. I don't know. Am I, am I, are you following no, no, me or you're, are you you're making, me? No, you're making total sense. And I think okay, um, I think we should keep reading because yes, I okay, think this great. it'll flesh itself out. Yeah. In a 180-page racist screed, the Buffalo shooter wrote that he was particularly inspired by the man behind the 2019 massacre at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, which, aimed, uh, which claimed 51 lives. The Christchurch shooter also left a manifesto entitled The Great Replacement which talked at length about the Muslim invasion of Europe. So the incident that most inspired the Buffalo shooter was a man of European descent, murdering Muslims, praying in mosques, located in a city pointedly named Christchurch. Yeah. Hmm, almost yeah. like it's perfectly lined up. Uh, yeah, uh, we didn't point that out before or anything, To mobilize... Dude. What's his name? Yeah. Who's the author of this article? Robert, Robert Jones. Bob. To mobilize exactly what you're talking about, which is, yes, look, religion is used and, uh, you know, manipulated by... Uh, elite ruling class, you know, uh, p- government, government, gov- yeah, it's got just say groups, in- different types of groups specifically have documented yeah. the use of religious agitation. We did it in Afghanistan and oh, Iraq. Yeah, we Yes, we, we specifically, it, you, you talk about the Shiites and the Muslims, and or not, to, what, sorry, Sunnis, the Sunnis and the Shiites and how they hate each other so much. There's documentation of the U.S. military calling in all the religious leaders. Once we invaded Iraq, we called in all the religious leaders. We put them in a big room, and then we separated them out, and then we provoked both sides to hate each other. It was part of the strategy. It is a common, well-known thing. So, you know, the idea that a corporate news person would be basically doing exactly that right now um, is, you know, it's just part of the plan. Let's keep going. The Christchurch shooter, in turn, took particular inspiration from the ideology of a terrorist who killed nearly 100 people at a youth camp uh, on uh, Utoya, 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 Utoya Island in Norway in 2011. The Utoya shooter used publish, uh, sorry, also published a manifesto which contains clear white Christian nationalist appeals throughout. He asked God to help him succeed in his mission to expel all Muslims from Europe, and he decried the way multiculturalism was de- de- deconstructing European culture and European Christendom. Toward the end of the document, he proclaimed, Onward, Christian sh- soldiers, celebrate us, the martyrs of the conservative revolution, for we will soon die in the kingdom of heaven. Psyop, in, psyop, it, psyop. Uh-huh. Yeah, My exactly. gosh, come on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So obvious, but okay, sorry. Uh-huh. In the U.S., but see, and that's kind of the funny part about it, because like, if you are Christian, you can read something like that and be like, oh yeah, no, uh, I mean, not this, he may or may not have been Christian, but he certainly is under these the like, influence of something else. <laughs> these are talking points that the FBI and certain intelligence agencies made as threats to America back in like 1998. Exactly. They had They're the, catalogs. The Armageddon papers or whatever they yep. were called. So exactly. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they in the U.S. Check, checks off that whole list. It's, it's, it's basically a checklist of uh, all of the PSYOP operations. Yeah, weaponized that white a- supremacy in the world. Exactly. Yeah. In the U.S., this drive to preserve white Christian dominance undergirded the worldview of the Ku Klux Klan when it reemerged in the early part of the 20th century. We rightly remember the terrorism aimed at black Americans, but the KKK was also explicitly anti-Jewish and anti-Catholic. It existed to protect the dominance of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. We know what the KKK <laughs> is. Great. Like, how is that r- relevant to just like Christianity in general? But okay. In 1960, in my home state of Mississippi, Governor Ross Barnett regularly blended his Christian identity with talk about the threat of white genocide. Okay. We get it. You had a racist pastor, <laughs> Robert Jones. We get it. Off the campaign trail, Barnett, Barnett also served as head of the large men of a, of the 
what? Head of the large men's Sunday school program <laughs> at the most... It, is it a Sunday school program for large men? Or is it a large men's Sunday school program? You know, you know what it probably was? It was probably a, a men's group, like a large men's group, and it mm-hmm. got messed up in translation or notes or something. Something, yeah. Large men's That's Sundays. if I'm giving them a benefit of the doubt. <laughs> but also Sunday schools for children. So, again, I'm not sure how familiar this guy is with, oh, I don't know, church. Uh, program at the most influential church in the state, First Baptist Church. After his successful segregationist campaign— Oh, you mean like Biden? Okay. FBC blessed him with a consecration service and a gift of pulpit of a pulpit Bible in recognition of his protection of their white and Christian supremacist worldview. Oh, did they say that? They said, "We give this to you to in defense of white supremacy in our Christian supremacist yeah, actually, worldview." Thank you. That's a good point. In the deconstruction of this article, I thought that exact same thing. Oh, good. That is not a quote. For the prize. That is just him saying words. <laughs> and there's no, you know, I mean, there's no source or picture. There's no nothing. He's just saying, hey, I had a racist pastor and he won a racist award from First Baptist Church, which is the most general name for a church in the country. <laughs> well, plus, there's, so here's the other thing. And, and, uh, the, the article, this article kind of gets into it as well. Every article that's talked about this issue of the race in America and all that kind of stuff, they all point to how there is a categoric sort of decline yeah. of the, the white man in Europe and the U.S., which I think is fascinating because it's like, uh, we must get rid of it. And then it's like, it's declining. And it's like, yeah, keep declining. Is that what they're going for? I mean, it's, it's just weird how it's all... Well, in the talk about the Great Reset, it's very funny, and we've already pointed this out in other episodes, where they will admit that, like, yes, the white, you know, whites are becoming a minority, and Christianity is becoming a minority, and these people are afraid of whites and Christians becoming a minority, but it's all a conspiracy, it's not real, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a, it's, it's a very it's confusing happening. sort of doublespeak thing. Yeah. Um, Now, he goes into, why are we seeing the rise in white supremacist violence over the last decade? In short, in the U.S. context, the election and the re-election of our first black president coincided with the sea change of no longer being a majority white Christian nation. As I noted in my book, The End of the White Christian America, white Christians went from 54% to 47% in that period, down to 44% today. These twin shocks to centuries of white Christian dominance (laughs) set the stage for Donald Trump. (laughs) Uh Which is funny, because it's like, okay, so white Christians, there's less and less and less of them, and they're no longer the majority. And somehow... Then we got Trump! Somehow the minority (laughs) elected Donald Trump, so it's their fault, but isn't it's kind of like opposite of how elections work. I don't know. It's just weird. Um, Trump's Make America... Oh, this is a great little leap here. Trump's Make American American Great Again formula. Wow, he, he says, can't even get the quote right. He doesn't even get it right. Again, he says Make American Great Again, which is not it. This is Time Magazine. Bob, you need to... Bob Jones. Find another job, man. <laughs> Make American great again. That's the second just sort of erroneous. <laughs> it's not even a typo. It's just it's an just erroneous wrong. fact. Yeah. And especially because uh, it's in quotes. It's like, exactly. <laughs> it makes it even worse. Like, Quoted it and didn't get it right. Yeah. That's what I mean. And, and you know what? When you're deconstructing and analyzing these articles, it is Time Magazine. One of the number one legacy, legendary, highly regarded royal news outlets, and not a single person, an editor, a proofreader, a copy editor, anybody, nobody could spot that Make America Great Again should not be Make American Great Again. Either that, either it's incompetence on the part of time, or... It's something on purpose, like it's a misquote or an erroneous thing. I don't know. It's just weird. Who knows? Who knows? It's suspect, though. 
Trump's Make American Great Again formula, the stoking of anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, anti-black sentiment, while making nativist appeals to the Christian right, contains all the tropes of the old replacement theory, the nostalgic appeal of, again, in quotes, the nostalgic appeal of, again, harkens back. The word, back, again? The word, again, harkens back to a 1950s America when white Christian churches were full and white Christians comprised a supermajority of the U.S. population, a period when we added, quote, under God to the Pledge of Allegiance ah. and, quote, in God we trust to our currency. When did that I happen? Thought, I thought you'd like that. Yeah. I thought I you'd like that. that. I, I believe that did happen right after that this. Was, that was part of what you're referring to, yeah. which was the very specific, intentional uh, creation of the sort of religious uh, conflicts that we are allegedly suffering today. Was a purposeful shift uh, and creation, more than anything, PSYOP PR campaign by the government, documented thanks to, uh, well, and, and explained to us and laid out quite nicely by uh, Mike Bennett. Uh, what's his book called? Uh, the Two Masters and Two, two Gospels. Yeah. That's what it is. Two Masters, Two Gospels. Uh, yeah, go check it out. Thanks, yeah. Dr. Future. Uh, yes, Under God and In God We Trust were added during the 50s, and that's a, that, that was all <laughs> part of the PSYOP of pitting religions against each other. And, not, and the, the, the direct quote, as to the, the you know why they did this, the House report from 1956 says that they changed the national motto to "In God We Trust" because it had "quote unquote" psychological value. Exactly. So, there you go. Yep. Yep. It's not this this whole thing that they the, the Bob is complaining about was one giant psyop. That's exactly <laughs> but he's not, the point. But he's not realizing it, and he's he doesn't blaming know it. white people and all Republicans, and thus becomes part of the psyop, Bob. Exactly, Come on, Bob. Exactly, exactly. So every point that he's making here is a reference to a, a purposeful, highly planned, very well executed uh, operation by the U.S. government. So when you talk about great replacement and the great replacement theory or the replacement theory or whatever, or even just the concept of Christian white nationalism was created as a psyop in the mid 20th century. And now it's being a uh, sort of, uh, I don't know. Charged with race because back then it was communism. Right. Yes. It was first against communism and yeah. then and switched over to race and, and it's being positioned as again, a beautiful control mechanism, just just pointing the gun in the other direction. Yeah. These fears about the Great Replacement are not fringe among conservative subgroups today. Now he goes through a whole bunch of statistics and um, and percentages. <laughs> QAnon and, and, believers, Republicans, and there's Fox so News. They are so messed up in the way that he is presenting them. And I sat there for, I spent about at least a half hour sitting there working out the way that he lays out these um, numbers. These, uh, these numbers because he does numbers of numbers and percentages of percentages right. and it's, I noticed it's that so too. <laughs> it's, it's so twisty turvy and it's you know obviously how to lie with statistics i mean he's creating a picture and i worked it out myself there are significantly easier ways he could have presented these numbers and it's honestly i would love to go through it all and it's just not the most important way we could spend our time right now but he he goes through four or five six paragraphs laying out polling numbers and then sort of twists them and 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 com like uh, it's just crazy he references them against one another in strange ways that sound they yield like one high thing. numbers they yield high percentages that right. make it seem like it's a bigger issue than it really might exactly. be. Exactly. Yeah. So he'll get to put the number like 45%, but if you go back and like deconstruct the weird roadmap of percentages of percentages of percentages that he lays out, you're like, oh, this is like 0.1%. Okay, right. weird. Why does he... <laughs> he just wanted to put big numbers. Anyways, yeah. I'm sorry. I spent too much time complaining about that. The Department of Homeland Security has declared that white supremacists remain... This is a quote. Remain the most persistent and lethal threat in the homeland. Problem, reaction, President solution. 
Exactly. Joe, uh, President Joe Biden, importantly, became the first U.S. president to use the words white supremacy in his inaugural address. Oh, gosh. Weird. I mean, if we, I mean, I'm pretty sure we had some pretty racist presidents. Why didn't they use it? Well, I mean, well, the, the, why didn't Trump use it? I mean, he's well, the yeah. most white supremacist man ever. How come he didn't say it? Uh huh. I mean, maybe he did, and he denounced it. And, and Trump know, it was wasn't a segregationist. Yeah, and Biden was. Yeah. Uh, and in the wake of the massacre in Buffalo last weekend, he called white supremacy a, quote, poison running through our body politic. But while each identified white supremacy ad- and dangerous ideologies, there is no acknowledgement of the documented ways right wing Christianity has nourished these views. Nourished. <laughs> the right wing Christianity has nourished white supremacy. There is a troubling religious double standard in the U.S. Oh, tell us about it. I would love to. One which threatens our safety and our democracy. If these same kinds of appeals and violent actions were being made and committed by Muslims, for example. What about most, ism? What about ism? Uh-huh. <laughs> most white Americans would be demanding actions to eradicate a domestic threat from radical Islamic terrorism. Gons, have we ever suffered radical Islamic terrorism in this country? I believe there was a uh, back in something twenty one years ago. Something a, is sort of ringing a bell. Yeah, there was hmm. um, these buildings that went down. Oh, okay. I was a wee young teenager. Actually, I was a well. Older, oh, but. oh. Well, that's not what Robert's talking oh, about. Oh, no, what is he talking about? Because Robert is talking about here. Uh, eradicated domestic threat from radical Islamic terrorism, a term we heard relentlessly during the Trump era. But because Christianity huh? is the dominant religion in this country, its role in supporting domestic terrorism has been literally unspeakable. The clear historical record mm, and contemporary <laughs> attitudinal data. Attitudinal merit, data, interesting. Attitudinal mm. data. Is that what, sentiment is, analysis? You know what? Yeah, this, data. this attitudinal data is a term that's been coming up a lot recently. <laughs> like polls. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like polls, but it's uh, but this term has been popping up pretty much every week. Um, attitudinal data was also used in the the uh, Glorify app article ah, too. Ah, interesting. So it's kind of it feels like kind of a new thing that they're popping in. It sounds in like stuff. sentiment analysis is what yeah. to me. I mean, it just yeah, you know, I would like have social to social media scraping and stuff like that to see what I haven't dug are into about. it, but that's that must basically be what it is. Um, the clear historical record and contemporary attitudinal data merit an urgent discussion of white Christian nationalism as a serious and growing threat to our democracy. If we are to understand the danger in which we find ourselves today, we will have to be able to use the words white Christian nationalism and domestic terrorism in the same sentence. You just did it. You just did it, uh, and Bob, I've, and, and you didn't capitalize if on the last sentence. That's true. Who, who is editing this piece here? Apparently nobody. Yeah, he starts <laughs> a sentence with a lowercase oh, i. Oh, man. Um, Come on, bro. And he's also acting as if white Christian nationalism and domestic terrorism have not been uttered in the same sentence before, I, which pretty yeah, much that's... Ex- he came up with the concept, man. He's We've, breaking through for Time Magazine. <laughs> It's been on a repeat since 2016, those two words together. Um, but it's interesting because that is that is what he claims. He just ends it with, we'll have to use the words white Christian nationalism and domestic terrorism in the same sentence. Yeah, that's, And that's there's nothing the, else. Because, like, <laughs> what is the action? What well, is that, the call to action? I was going to say, that's the, that's the call to action right there is uh, associate... Uh, white Christian nationalism to domestic terrorism. Anytime you say white or Christian or nationalism or all three together, preferably, uh, you're yeah. talking about domestic terrorists. So, well, let you me, know, the White House, we, we are domestically terrorized by now the let, uh, building. Now, let me make a statement <laughs> that I think will make a point. Mm-hmm. Gons, I think... Well, Th- this, by the way, our, you are our a person roadmap, of color. Yeah, I'm, uh, by the way, our roadmap to this episode has completely exploded. So, just, yeah, just we're to totally, you know. we're it's totally okay. We're, we're up. tackling important issues. So I, I guess uh, it's yeah. okay. We're going to go late, and that's just what's going to happen. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, as, I'm as personally, so, so you're our person of color here sure, for those who are just listening who don't know. I've sure. definitely heard uh, you're, you're a Japanese of d- Japanese descent. Mm-hmm. I am a white Christian man mm-hmm. now. 
as a white Christian man, I can confidently and enthusiastically denounce the very idea of white Christian nationalism. Mm. The idea that, you know, America is for white Christians. It is a nation for white Christians. That is false. It is it's just patently false. It is yeah. uh Evidently, I mean, obviously erroneous. It is unbiblical, and is it is ahistorical, and it is you know there's a laundry list of reasons why the idea that America is for white Christians and no one else is patently ludicrous. Now, unfortunately, for some reason, there are moments where I find my fellow white Christian. Uh, unable to sort of say those things. And if this guy is coming in here saying we need to talk about white Christian nationalism and domestic terrorism in the same sentence, look, I'm not saying, I'm, I, I don't, I have no, I'm not convinced to go ahead and uh, equate those things. But my experience has been every white Christian I have literally known in my entire life <laughs> personally, at least, uh, would agree with me with the statements that I just said. Hmm. But the problem is that the Times Magazine and the news corporations, that's not a very profitable thing for them to report on. It is much more profitable for them to report on the minority of Admittedly, some there are racists, and there are some Christian racists. It's, and I, I would even imagine that, that yeah. there are some white Christian nationalist racists. I was, yeah, I was going to say it. It's even muddier than that. I would say because, in in a sense, you can argue that there, especially in Europe, maybe not. I mean, there's. I guess you can argue some of it in the U.S., but uh, some of the things that have happened in some European countries, you have to at least see that. Like, but there is kind of a genocidal uh, replacement uh, feel to know. some of the I'm, things happening. I'm not saying that that's what it's, you know, in based which direction? on the, the theories uh, per se, but I'm just saying in terms of the actions that have taken place. So you're talking about the, the terrorist attacks, the shootings. What no, you, no, no, no. I'm talking, talking I'm talking about just the, the cultural uh, population, mer- like Sweden, for example, um, UK, you can argue. Well, I, I, and it's, I can't speak for other countries. I, I'm, I'm not going to yeah. speak well, for I'm other I'm just countries. saying that, that, that that's what I hear is it's not so much like, oh, the white race is being taken over. It's more like, hey, our sort of long storied culture in these countries is being yeah, dismissed but see, it's and dismantled. It's different for the U.S. It's I know different, it's different for the U.S. Because you talk about the Nordic countries, they have... They have they, history. Their history goes thousands right. of years. Right. You know, it's the more US challenging is in the U.S. because there's a little is that, over 200 years yeah, old. Yeah. And, the his, you know, if you talk about a, a U.S. culture, look, <laughs> I love the U.S. I love American history. I love American culture. I'm a huge yeah. fan. But, you know, it's a little different because our history is not so not so right. long. We don't, we don't have the same but kind of a... But honestly, I'm, that's not even like... I, I, I personally do not see that as a threat. Uh I mean, what are they going to – I mean, given that the U.S., most of our history was even, like, made up, and a lot of it actually isn't true, and a lot of it is a full-on psyop, as we we discussed uh, with the the Cold War, religious war, um, started by the government, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole country's history has an element of psyop. And so, uh, you know, once you see that and you know that – you realize, you know, American history has been controlled by, you know, elite lizard people forever. And, and whatever we hold as some sort of sacred history uh, has been created. Oh, modern for mythologies, us. yeah. Yeah, it's modern mythologies. But that's not even the point. I mean, the point is that uh, the as, as a white Christian man, th- reading this sort of article is disappointing. Because, of course, there are bad people, there are bad Christians, there are bad white Christians, and there are indeed white Christian nationalists that believe that, you know, this place is meant for us and nobody else. I don't personally follow the argumentation for that very easily. Yeah, um, but even but, amongst those people, the, not all of them are violent or want to do and violent things indeed. and all that kind of I mean, it gets uh, 
really minutia. even by the numbers they're not all violent yeah. um and that is not to to, to sort of de- denounce or deny the you know the, the, the violence that has been yeah. done but the point is when you look at this the the past couple weeks after the buffalo shooting and you see the massive mobilization of the information flow to um basically lump in all christians you know <laughs> yeah there's you a know? hurting happening for sure in terms of you categorizing think about, and labeling you think about 911 right when the country again from the top down from the government all the way down mm-hmm. uh used the psychological operation of basically convincing us that all muslims were terrorists yeah. and then we spent the past 20 years trying to deprogram the idea that Every Muslim individual is some sort of violent terrorist. Right. That that was really the 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 seeds of the wokeness that we're experiencing now. Which is exactly which is a liberal, which is patently part of the liberal mission right. is to convince everybody that not every Muslim is a terrorist. Which and I think most that is a noble, like, yeah, yes, uh, we agree. <laughs> it seems, it seems obvious now, but if you did not live through it, which yeah. m- a lot of our younger listeners didn't live through it, yeah, it's true. Uh, you know, there was a time much like almost exactly like what we're living through now pointed towards white Christians as, you know, they're all terrorists and they all want to kill us. And this is just look at their literature, look at their sermons, look at their everything. Look, they just, they just love, you know, they just make American great again. See, come on. Can't you see it? The same thing was done in the early 2000s towards Muslims. And there was a concerted long social, I mean, it was kind of the, the, the key that opened the door to social, what just social justice is today was convincing everybody that not every single individual Muslim was a violent terrorist and yet we are watching an exact repeat of the playbook just towards white christians now i mean it's like i can't even take it personally because it's it's no different than them repeating the playbook of covid and monkeypox Yes, and they're just it, it's the, the it's, marginalizing it's a, of a group. almost a one for one comparison yeah. uh, between the covid n- narrative playing out and what we're seeing the monkeypox narrative playing it creates out creates an enemy in the narrative. And exactly. then you give fuel to and I, I, you know, I'm not sorry to say this, but it will fuel a lot of people of color, probably some fellow. Oh, yeah. Japanese people that'll read this article and say, oh, the evil white man, oh, you know, <laughs> they don't go to churches, make you supremacy or whatever, you know, like yeah. th- those people are going to be out there and they'll use an article like this from Time Magazine, a well-established uh, outlet to be racist towards white people. I mean, that right. was crazy, well, but that's probably what's going to happen here. Let me wrap it up with this. Sure. My concern with this movement identifying this pattern once again we've seen it it's very familiar to us yeah uh just pointed in a different direction now my call to action is uh you know christians must start being very vocal because what's also part of this is they are tricking christians and i can feel it walking the i can feel myself walking the edge as i'm talking about this and am i as i'm reading it they, there is a bait set for mm. all white Christians here Ooh. to see this as a threat to them exactly. And, to, exactly and to respond yes. in a way that will confirm to any outside observer that indeed, you know, we're hostile. Right. But the call to action for in for me, for me personally, I, and I invite people to do the same, which is, you know, we uh, our holy scriptures, the Bible, you know, have so much to say about racism and even nationalism and even all sorts of these things. It is time to become educated, to get into your Bible, to prepare your mind, your intellect, your spirit uh, to to respond, not in hostility or defensiveness to this situation, but to equip yourself to educate those who want to lump you in with this group, white Christian nationalists. There is so much there that 
not just the Old Testament or the New Testament or the words of Jesus, or throughout there are uh, uh, axiomatic ways of describing God's uh, attitude both towards racism, nationalism, violence, uh, all these things yeah. that are simply not understood nor care to be understood by people writing articles like this. And much like how a lot of the testimonies of, you know, regular Muslim people living in the U.S. in the early 2000s had to sort of steal themselves and prepare themselves to prove that they are not terrorists uh, and to make a case for themselves. This is a very real situation that um, Christians, white Christians specifically, are going to need to be prepared for. And do not be baited by these types of things. Do not be baited by preachers and teachers and YouTubers and whoever who want to get you into a sort of defensive, combative space um, with culture, because that is just going to fuel this culture war, and yeah. it is not going to work out well for us. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And the uh, the thing that that keeps kept popping into my mind when I you know was really kind of looking into the Great Replacement. What is the actual Great Replacement taking place? Uh, are you referring to like a spiritual one? Well, maybe. Uh, be, but more so in the context or the of the political we, one, not just political, but well, tell if, me. Okay. So while the media want to spin up this race war, this sort of racial, this, this, uh, you know, I, I'm almost thinking that they want more, like you said, they've set the bait. They want more white Christians to sort of buy into this counter narrative, right? Oh, they just want you to get fired up. They, they want you to get right. fired up and fight against this. And that will prove their point. And you're right, and that the, they're afraid that they're being replaced. All this stuff. Meanwhile, you know what's replacing everybody? Robots. Robots. Robots and machines. <laughs> I mean, think about that. Think about yeah, the sign know, up of that. I, I mean, I it's like a, it's it's a meme. I had a meme in my head. I don't know what the exact sort of sequence of images would be, but it would be kind of like a some somebody you know defending the white race, and then another person defending the black race, or whatever it might be, some racial tension, and then like the robot in the background saying like, "I'm going to replace you all, so you guys mm -hmm, keep fighting right. while yeah. I sneak in and you know just uh, take over all the things." And that's that's sort of I don't know. There's a layer to this that we. Uh, probably have this a little more unique because everything falls back to robots and machines and technology, but that's what I see, man. I, I, and, it's, and I mean, you got to include the lizard people in there. Remember culture war has one purpose and this is culture war. Culture war has one purpose and that is to distract us distract. from the people who are really pulling the strings. Yeah. Okay. You get caught up in a culture war and you make it your mission to fight this culture war. It is taking your attention away from the, the real, the more important, uh, you know, sort of dialectic well, the, issue, the which is the elites. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the actual the, spiritual the, war taking place, uh, you get caught up in the, you know, the, the, the talk of the white supremacy, all that stuff. Yeah. You, you're wasting precious time that you could be talking about more uh cosmic and eternal issues so sure yeah well yeah. and there's certainly a balance to be found so there you go anyways i feel it's very important this is time magazine this is not just some article on in deep in the recesses of nbc or something this is a this is a, a flagship article that's going around meant to tie up all the loose ends of the week now or more of great replacement uh you know information flow control and psyop being perpetrated on the country and the world and uh this really put a bow on it which signaled to me that uh you know this is an actual quite actually quite a dire situation that t it requires calm heads Lots of time in prayer and in the Bible, and being um, being s sort of stealing your resolve to not let your strings get pulled by those who want to suck you into a culture war. That is how we lose in this situation. So we'll do that. And uh, while you ponder that, folks, we'll need to uh, go and take a quick break. It's break time.
That's right. We're going to take a quick break because, you know, believe it or not, this is an ind- piece of independent media. This is independent <laughs> news analysis and deconstruction, folks. If we were taking any corporate money, uh, even, you know, advertising, affiliate codes, partnerships, uh, sponsorships, whatever we were doing, we certainly could not spend almost an hour talking about uh, a very dire spiritual culture war coming down upon us to, uh, you know, and, and gather our resolve to not... Are we still on YouTube? Grab the Are bait. We, we haven't been kicked off yet? That's good. I, That's a good I, sign. Who, who even knows, man? Uh, so anyways, you know, if we were being funded by anything except the independent producers, the individual people who get value from this show, we could not do what we do. We only get to do this because of listeners like you who get value out of these conversations, out of these uh, deconstructions and analyses and whatever we do here. Uh, If you get value out of it, you got to put value back in. It's just the only way that it works. And I'm just going to be straightforward with that now Um, because we're moving into a time where the the establishment, the media establishment is getting more and more serious uh, about taking back control. And how do they control things? Well, they're corporations, so they control things with capital. And uh, capital rules the world. And, you know, it's very influential. And not just capital, but lack of capital. These conversations would not be possible on a regular basis if it were not for the participation of our producers. And producers are people just like you who get value out of the show and put value back in. You can do it in several different ways. You know, you can put value in with your time, your talent, or your treasure. We're going to take a second and thank those who are keeping this show going with their treasure. And uh, you can do that a couple of ways. You can go to patreon.com com slash ccnt or even better canarycryradio.com slash support canarycryradio.com slash support and i'd like to remind you that it is much less about the amount that you give necessarily and uh, more about your willingness to support uh, what God is doing here. If you believe that God is doing something with this show in your life and the lives of others, uh, simply participating in very simple ways, in ways that do not put yourself uh, at any more risk than you are tolerant of, uh, that means the world to us. Um, yes. And However, there are certain producers who uh, really carry the load for us when things get squirrely, things get uncertain, things get unstable, uh, living on the the value for value model. Our executive producers come in and carry the load, not just for us, but they uh, provide the ability for us to do this show for those who are unable to produce in such generosity. And that's why we want to thank them now. You missed oh, the yeah. top there. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's uh, usually all that cool stuff I said I would have said with that music playing. Okay. Uh, I want to thank our first executive producer, and that is executive producer Darren S. Thank you, Darren S. Uh huh. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And Darren S. Let me double check something here. Uh, Darren S. came in last Friday, actually. So he's he's been sitting in the he's <laughs> that that round's been in the chamber for a few days. It's ah. kind of exciting when somebody comes in uh, early like that because we know, know uh, that you know, we're going to survive till Monday. If we did a, a cutoff time, that's what that's what every episode would be, right? <laughs> right. It would be the one guy who came in. Yeah. A couple days. Anticipation. Ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Darren S. came in in a nice round number, which oh, we okay. appreciate very much. And this is my opportunity to remind everybody, uh, we always lean towards anonymity. If you come in with a nice round number, uh, we don't read the amount. That's your signal to us that we, you know, you don't want us to read the amount. If you don't mind us reading the amount, you just make it a funky number, you know, whatever it might be. People do threes, three, three, threes, or 33 cents, or, you know, 72s, 42s, whatever, you know, you just make it something weird. Um, but executive producer Darren S came in and said, uh, I want to help fund the Canary Cry Supply Drop ca- Challenge coin. So he's right. pitching in for that. And on top of that, well, well, just, we'll thank him for another thing in a second. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, executive producer Darren S. 
Oh, that's not the one I'm looking for. This Where'd is you right find here. this? There you go, Darren. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've also got executive producer One Lousy Petunia. Thank you, One Lousy Petunia. Indeed. Thank you so much. And One Lousy Petunia comes in for, I believe this was 111 plus fees. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, because again, the link tree fees are all messed up. It's it's unusual, but I think it was one eleven eleven. Uh, so thank you very much, one lousy petunia, and one lousy petunia sent a little uh, a little note that just said love, one lousy petunia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Executive one lousy producer. petunia, for love. Mm-hmm. Where'd you find this? And I appreciate, and do it. Uh, just real quick, appreciate everybody mm-hmm. coming in, especially recently. Just, be, you know, Basil, you and I were talking. There's some stuff happening in my personal life. Like, stuff happening. Oh, my goodness. What is happening? Like, blah. So. Yeah. Your which help makes, is very much appreciated. Thank you. It, which really, you know, it's we're, we're constantly sort of talking about how lucky we are. Because blessed. The, I would say the, blessed. Blessed, of More. course. Yes, yes. Sorry. I was mean to say blessed. <laughs> It's an interesting situation because, uh, you know, when you just have an employer, which we've both have, uh-huh. have had, yeah. and when scary things happen, you know, you, you, it's, it's stable. It's nice having an employer. Right. Um, but if that one employer has some sort of problem, then you are <laughs> totally out of luck or out of whatever. <laughs> A but, job. Uh, <laughs> out of a job, yes. But uh, it's kind of fun because we have like – thousands of employers right yeah you guys <laughs> and all uh, you know a, hand, a handful of them pay our our bills every episode and of course they revolve and things like that except for our longtime street uh, streakers uh but yeah it's it's just very interesting it's it, it, you don't get the sort of um i don't know stability of i guess oh expecting. there's no stability that's <laughs> no why stability. that's why the appreciation is real because yes but every time you come you, in it's uh you it makes always a difference. know when things get squirrely you know if one person decides it's not worth producing the show that's okay there will be somebody else who thinks so anyways that's just a bunch of rambling anyways <laughs> let's talk about supply drop here we go That's right, CanaryCrySupplyDrop.com. Go check it out. It's our uh, producer uh, appreciation campaign. If you go there, you sign up, you you commit to supporting the show for thirty three thirty three a month. What is that? That's like three bucks a show. I mean, we do twelve episodes, so yeah, that's about th- less than three dollars per episode. Uh, and on top of that, we send you some super cool, custom made, made in America, producer created, artist designed uh, Canary Cry news talk items, swag, baby. You can't get it anywhere else. We don't do retail. No. This is only for our producers, just a way for us to return some value back to them for committing to keeping us going. And, uh, oh my gosh, we just got another thing locked down for the supply drop. You're going to be so stoked. Um, But I'll tell you about that next episode. (laughs) But this is going to be a good supply drop, folks. Uh, So go sign up. If you haven't signed up or if you've been humming and hawing about it, you have one week and one day to decide. You have one week you have and one, one week day. And one day. Do not wait any longer, folks. If you're interested, if you want to support the show, uh, go sign up for the supply drop at canarycrysupplydrop.com. I'll be giving more details next episode. Uh, but r- immediately, right off the bat, we will send you the Canary Cry Code Breaker book. It's an, uh, an ARG. It's a podcast companion game that hundreds of people right now are playing uh, during the podcast while they listen. They're breaking codes, finding clues, doing a thing, going on a little adventure through time and space, baby. It's a good time. And if you want to play that, we'll send you that immediately if you sign up for the supply drop in the next week and a day. Uh, We are still trying to hit our goal of 12 more um, supply droppers by the week and a day. Uh, we're, we're not quite halfway there. Uh, so, you know, if you want to do that, help us out where it's going to let us upgrade some of the items in the supply drop. And, uh, you know, one of these people that did that was good old Darren S baby. Hey, he's back already. That's right. Woo. Our executive producer also signed up for the supply drop cause he's the man. Thank, Thank you, you very much. 
Aaron S. So there you go. Go to canarycrysupplydrop.com and sign up, baby. It's going to be awesome. Gons, we had somebody ask uh, where they could donate at, and I was going to say, if you could pop the link into the chat so people can just click on it, it's just sure. canarycryradio.com slash support, um, and or you can click on it in the chat there. All right. But we also have some more producers who came in. Let's thank them now. And it's just another one of these kind of small handful producer days, but that's uh, we're doing okay. All right, let's make this happen. We've got uh, starting off with uh, progress, not perfection. Producer, progress, not perfection. All right, coming in with the eleven eleven. Oh, 1111, too. Hold uh-huh. on, hold on. I got all mixed up here because we're... Oh, yeah. Keep that trigger <laughs> finger ready, by the way. <laughs> Throw, throwing me some curveballs. Thank you. Progress to not perfection. Perfect. Progress not to perfection. Is it not or N2, like like taking progress into perfection? No, it's progress not perfection. Right, he okay. or <laughs> she did something very cool where there's no vowels yeah. in the words. It's very hip, very mm, fun. Yes. Um, here's a note. Demooch. Long time listener. Long time listener. First time giver. Thanks for the laughs and the insights. Let your light so shine. Thanks. Progress, not perfection. Thank you very much, producer. Thank you. Progress, not perfection. Long time listener. First time giver. We love to see it. If that sounds like you out there, dear listener. Just come on, come on, baby. Let us demute you. I like that. Long time listener, first time giver. Yeah. Mm. All right. Next up, we've got uh, producer Morv Morv. on a 94 episode streak. 94 episodes. Where are we? Mm. Here we go. Here we go. That's right. (laughs) No, no. Thank you very much, Producer Moore. Thank you, Moore. Next up, we've got uh, Producer James M. Now, James James M. M. was one of the individuals who got kind of lost in our our little admin hiccup the past couple episodes. Uh, But I believe James M. is on a three-episode streak. Which means... He's on. He's heating up, baby. He's heating up. Very That's good. right. And if I have that wrong, James M., just send us a message. We'll fix it. Uh, James M. comes in with a pocket full of sevens and fees and a note that says, love you guys. Made it in before the show this time. Yes, we're very proud of you, James M. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next up, we have Sir JC, Knight of the Techno Squatch on a 106 episode streak. 106. Yeah, 106, yeah. baby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh huh. And there's a note here. What's it going to take for us to get a Canary Cry convention with all of our favorite podcasters, authors, and biblical scholars? Happy Monday. Gary knows what day it is. Mm. Gary, what day is it? Monday. 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 What's it going to take? Honestly, just money, man. Money. <laughs> Putting on conventions is expensive stuff. That's true. We yeah. have thought about this. We've talked about this. We've talked to our friends, our podcaster friends, our author friends, our scholar friends. We've talked about everybody. Our, if there, we could do it. We, we could do, do it. it. Yeah, we can do it. It would just take thing. money. Um, it would probably be, I think, the way to do it. We would kind of get some commitments from people, and then we'd have to pre-sell tickets, and we'd have to do it. I mean, because that's the only way we're going to get the money. We need to pay the bills for it. Um, Unless we, like, borrow money, which is a silly thing to do nowadays. Uh, So, there you go. Come on, Jerome Powell. Print us some cash, bro. More, I would say more than anything, it would take a team of producers to get serious and help us with it. Hint, hint. Because Gons (laughs) Gons and I can only do so much, and it takes a big team of people to really pull something off like that. It's pretty crazy to pull off Yeah, so I don't know. I'm open to to open conversations with any producers who are interested in maybe doing that. Um, But yeah, it's a a big undertaking. If you go to canarycryradio.com slash support and scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see a producer form. It's like a, it's like a a little quiz thing that I made. Uh, if you fill that out and in there, you'll, you'll have a chance to mention something. Just mention you want to help out with a convention, uh, Canary Cry Con. Go ahead and uh, fill that form out. 
and and send it in. And that's how, that's kind of how we make first contact with producers who want to help out with stuff. Yeah. Or you or you could just email us. All right. Next up, we got uh, LX Protocol V2, the producer bot. Thank you, LX Protocol V2. Thank you very much. And he's, I believe, on a 35 episode streak. Coming in with a pocket full of sevens and fees and a note that says Happy Monday. Oh, Prayer oh, and good. blessings to all those who need it. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we give you him a Monday? Give him a Monday. Uh, give him a Monday. Gary, what day is it? Ow, Monday. 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 All right. That concludes our list of producers. Oh, let me see here. I can go over here and pop in and see if anything's come on through. No, no, no. These are all for next episode. Okay. Uh, yep. That concludes our list of producers who come in for in the amount of 777 or more, which entitles them to have a note read on the show. But we got a few more people to thank, and they go like this. Starting with Jonathan F. Thank, thank you, you, Jonathan F. Jonathan F. Here he is. Here's the man. Thank you, producer Jonathan F. Uh, next up. Oh, Jonathan F. might have gotten lost in the admin mix-up. So let me know if you're on a streak. I don't think he is. Um, Next up, we've got Sir Scott, Knight of Truth, on a 149-episode streak. Thank you, Sir Scott. Boogity, boogity. Boogity, boogity. Next up, we've got Sir Casey, the Shield Knight, on a 159-episode streak. Thank you, Sir Casey. Thank you very much, Sir Casey. Next up, we got the Streak Sisters. I'm going to start with Gail M today on 124 episode Streak. Thank you, Gail M. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Next up, we got uh, Veronica D on 124 episodes. Thank you, Veronica D. Next up, we got Jackie U on a 64 episode streak. Thank you, Jackie U. That's right. Women rule. Uh, next up, oopsies, my document is stuck. Do you know who's. Oh, here it is. Uh, we got uh, Runk Smash on Runk a five smash. episode streak. Streak. Let's give him a. Uh, Give Runk Smash Streakalicious. You got Streakalicious sitting around there? Streakalicious. Oh, I have Streak Sitter. Hold on. What are these? Oh, wait. Oh, no. Here we go. Oh, 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 yeah. Streakalicious. There we go. There Thank you, Runky. Runky, Runky, Runky boy. <laughs> last last but not least, we got Sir James, Ninth Servant of the Lion of Judah on a 91 episode streak. Come on, Streaky. Come on, everybody. Thank you, Sir James. Mm hmm. Thank you very much. That concludes our list of financial producers for this episode. Thank you guys so much for making it work, and thank you for your patronage. Shut up and take my money. Thank you for your patronage. Thank you for your patronage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your patronage. Money. T six. Two. Two. Repeat. E. T six two two. Please leave a message after the tone. 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 At the tone, please record your message. Leave a message. Beep. Message. That's right. If you go to canarycrynewstalk.com, you'll see a little green tab. Clip on, click on that tab, and you will uh, see another button pop up. Leave us a message. It's a little record button. It's awesome. You're going to love it. You're giving us permission to play that message, but it's not guaranteed. But go ahead. Give it a try. Test your luck. Mm. We have I no am a... speak pipe today. Oh, not a one, huh? Not a one. Not a one. Okay. Well, that shortens the break a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for shortening the break, everybody who didn't leave a message. <laughs> well, there you go. Go have fun with it, folks, for next episode. I am dropping the link to the chat people, and I'm thinking maybe we should put the link in the show notes, Gons, if you can make a note of that. Okay. And I'm going what? to send you the link to it. Okay. This is the link to the 
producer form. Ah, if you are an individual okay. who would like to help out the show, produce, you know, maybe financially is not in the cards for you or whatever, maybe making music or art is not your thing. Um, but if you go fill out this form, just let us know about yourself and what you're interested in and stuff like that. Uh, if you're trying to produce the show in a different way, just make yourself available, join the team, become a part of the Canary Cry movement, man. Uh, just fill out this form, send it in. It goes goes straight to us and we can see you and uh, we'll reach out, get in touch. I'm popping it into the chat now. And gone. So let's put that in the show notes for those who listen on Apple Podcasts or whatever. So if you're interested, Apple Podcast listener, it'll just be right there in the show notes. Go check it out. Okay. Well, I think that's it for this break. Yeah? No? I think so. Um, All right. Um, we do have some COVID news. So YouTubers, you're going to need to go find a different place to watch the show. We're on Odyssey, Rumble, Twitch, DLive. We're all over the place. Go to canarycry.party to find a new location. And we will be there waiting for you. Yes, it's wake up time. Hey, y'all, wake up. Bye, YouTube. Bye, YouTube. Bye, YouTube. Rumble, Odyssey, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, you can find all those links at canarycry.party as well. Too hot for YouTube. YouTube. Now you see me. Now you don't. Nice. Nice. Okay. Hold on. Well, gotta gotta mm. hit the clickety click. Oh, gotta the do the 